Okay, let's start the show. Where the hell's Norm? It is January first, twenty January thirtieth, twenty fourteen. Welcome to this is only a test, the official podcast of Tested.com. God damn it, I'm all over the place today. I'm good with it. I think it works. Yeah. I'm Will Smith. Joey's out today, so the whole system is out of whack. I don't know what's going on here. Norm, how are you doing? Uh, I was a producer for five seconds i would say I adjusted the camera three and a half. you did aim the camera yeah and then and then fade us out from black exactly so you, it's you just know what fade out means or fade in yeah that's when it goes from black to uh not black it means the, it indicates the passing of time really in movies <laughs> i thought that was a clock wipe <laughs> maybe in the 80s or the 70s but a, uh, typically a fade out and a fade in fade to black is the passing yeah but i'm of not time. sure a fade up indicates the passage of time jeremy williams is here hi hello jeremy hi it's, um, Amateur cinematography. Okay. <laughs> we got to talk about this B-Wing thing. Oh, good. I'm going to be your punching bag. Because, no, no, no. I'm not even going to get into that. But but okay. you guys can't find a still from Return of, just to be clear, Return of the Jedi, the only Star Wars movie that to date has featured the B-Wing starfighter, the greatest starfighter in the... It's a bomber. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a, let's see, what is it? It's the, it's like a torpedo bomber almost. Is the idea. I'll take the blame here. I did not recognize this spaceship, which if you're watching the video, you might be able to see in my hands. It's this S- shaped like a science fiction crucifix. <laughs> science fiction no, it, crucifix. It, the wings fold up and down, though. <laughs> see, Even that, the that's what makes one. it science fiction. Yeah. It's, wow, it's like that, a, that it's makes like it way 14. more edgy. <laughs> um, and I'm told it's a B-wing. But I challenge you guys to find where it's, men- where it's called a B-wing in the movie. Well, okay, so the, it is definitely in the hangar scene. Well, okay, they didn't name anything in the movie. X-Wings. They did say lock your S-Foils in the attack. They, they didn't call the Snowspeeders Snowspeeders. They and called them Speeders. S-Foils, not X-Foils. I, I know, but it should have been X-Foils. S-Foils. <laughs> um, the, the Y-Wing, I don't think they... They did call the Y-Wing the Y-Wing in the Y-Wing first movie. Y-Wing looks like a Y, which makes sense. They called it the Star Destroyer and the Super Star Destroyer by names. Yeah, and they gave one of them a name, even the executor. They gave a couple of them a name. There's a, there's the one that really I didn't know that. Yeah, Ex- executor is a superstar destroyer. That's just to start a Darth Vader ship. But the one that the guy that went into the asteroid belt and got killed by De- Darth Vader using telekinesis, Focus that on one has a name on too. That superstar I can't remember destroyer. what his name is though. Yeah, um, too late. The A wing. Yeah, it kind of looks like I don't remember a them fat call, A, them that. but I recognize the A wing. It doesn't look totally unlike the snow, snow speeder. speeder, correct? Yeah, it's a similar, similar kind the of color shape. is different. The color scheme, but, um, but this B wing is a real mystery. I don't remember seeing this in the movie, but I trust you. It, it is it, absolutely in it, the movie. It is in the movie. I assure you, sir. Does it fly? <laughs> it's in the. It's in the. <laughs> it's in the Armada. Yeah, it's in. It's in the big fight. Um, really? Okay. Okay. So I see toys. Is it a good guy ship? It's it a good is, guy. Yes, of course, it's, it's, a, yes. it's a something wing. It's a letter wing. Got yeah. it. Got it. That was designed to destroy assault <laughs> frigates, I think. That's the that's the extended universe fiction <laughs> no, for the B-Wing. All right. I think maybe assault, somebody's embellishing here. The assault frigate is the ship that... Um, no, I, I learned all the, the assault frigate was. The assault frigate is the one at the end of Empire Strikes, Strikes Back where Luke's gotten his hand cut off. And the he's, ass frigs, he's, yeah. Yeah, the ass frigs. Okay. He's in, I learned all this from playing X-Wing. Did you guys not play X-Wing in TIE Fighter? I did. This stuff is all in there. It was all in the imagination. During, during... I don't consider that canon. I, it's, of course so, it's not so, canon. It's a fucking video so game. So I didn't, I didn't digest it maybe as well as I just did. don't forget stuff. You know, that's important. Like, like Star like Wars, spaceships. Um, the, yeah, you, you go through the whole, uh, the, like you have to rescue the B-Wing plan in either X-Wing or TIE Fighter, one of those expansions or something. There's an expansion for X-Wing that is all about the B-Wing. Really? You get to fly the B-Wing. It's a big deal. Okay. I paid money to fly the B-Wing. Holy cow. This is all knowledge that's gone from you. That's great. You know how I know you're, you're a dad, Jeremy? (sighs) Because I don't know what a B-Wing is. You don't know what a B-Wing is. (laughs) Come full circle and you'll have to learn. I saw a dude with a LucasArts shirt. At Super Duper Burgers uh, this like Ooh, la- la- burger last place. weekend, burger. and Super I had duper. to. I like I said, did you work there? He said, Yeah, I used to. I was like, oh, I'm so sorry, man. 
Yeah. I hit, sorry to bring you down. I saw a guy with a kink.com sweatshirt on this morning, just walking down the street. I don't know. Maybe he's a fan. He could have been a fan. I don't know which is worse. I think that's a, that's a place that makes adult content. <laughs> It's the best way I could describe that. You live in San Francisco. There was a big controversy because they took over the armory in the mission years ago and made it like a weird slave dungeon, basically. There's a f- f- building they make in the mission. They make fetish porn in the mission. Called the armory. And they don't do it anymore? Mm. I think they I think they're still, still there. Okay. Do. At I, least, yeah. People were upset when they took it over. Well, some people were upset. Some people were strongly pro. I don't have an opinion I can imagine. This. Yeah, that, that yeah. audience is going to be pretty excited about that. Yeah. But but like the neighborhood association probably wasn't so keen yeah. on the fetish pornographers moving into their neighborhood into associations. Their neighborhood. I don't think there's a neighborhood association. The, the Nayasses. Also. You're all about wow. making the 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 uh, the ass frig, the Nayasses shortenings. Okay. Um, kind of a slow news. I mean, there's a couple of big news items this week, but also kind of a slow news week. Uh, thanks for joining the podcast, Jeremy. It's always good to have you. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, some people don't know who you are. Uh, and people have, have requested that yes, your guests are described. Which is, which is why I, I, I oh, did really? this, this segment. I felt like um, Jeremy has been on at this point, what, yeah. a good half dozen, ten times? Not everyone watches the podcast. Well, that's, uh, there, that's Jeremy Williams, a good friend of Tested. We used to work together uh, back in the magazine days. Uh, you were an editor at PC Gamer magazine. Yeah, previews editor, disc editor, mm-hmm. w- webmaster. Web, the first webmaster. My first professional interaction with you, Mr. Williams, was as our podcast producer at Maximum That's right. PC. That's right. You and Dan Morris were largely responsible for us starting a podcast over there. Yeah. Um, and uh, my first interaction with you was uh, playing Quake 3 matches with you at the office. Oh. Uh, which you would destroy me, and then in one-on-one, and then you come over and go, thanks, thanks for the game. And then... I had a... A big old box full of money, and, and it, you could take the money if you beat me at Quake 3. Really? You're that good at Quake 3? I was undefeated in the office. Mm-hmm. So did you ever play... Remember, we used to host a server downstairs, a Quake 3 server. At Max PC? At Max PC. That was in the... It was just for in the building. It was... We had a lot more free time back then. <laughs> but I think mostly the PC Accelerator guys played with us, not yeah. the PC Gamer guys. It was mostly TFC. I mean, in terms of, like, big old games in the office, at least for us. Well, then, and I think you were already in Chicago by the time the Battlefield 1942 craze took over. I was. Over. Yeah. I was. Yeah, I missed that. Yeah, was, you skipped over all of Counter-Strike, and oh. it was... Um, but I feel like I got to know you playing TF2. We played a lot of TF2 back in the day. We played that for a year or two. Maybe, maybe two or three. Yeah, it feels like it was a long time. Um, it's worth mentioning Magazine, who is one of our moderators on the forums and a you know all-around good guy, is starting TF Tuesdays again. Sweet. So if you want to play TF2 with dudes from Tested... Join the tested group on Steam. Are you playing? Uh, I, I haven't yet. It's hard for me to play multiplayer stuff uh, for reasons that you will understand. <laughs> That's um, a six-year-old game. Yeah, it doesn't mean it's not it will fun. will be six years old soon. But it, uh, every Is time... That all? I thought it was almost I thought 10. it was seven. Yeah. Oh, wait. Really? Oh, wait? The beta was out for no, a long time. No, it's not oh, wait, dude. I thought it was oh, seven. No, it's like... Because oh, wait is when I moved back. Yeah, uh, we were long done playing that game. I no, no. We well, played when you lived here, because I didn't know you lived oh, here seven. for a while. When yeah, we were so playing. it is a six over six year old game. Are we talking about yeah. TF two here? TF two, only 07. All right. Um, you've had a busy few years, but certainly it's hard to play multiplayer stuff because I I feel like bad taking up a slot when I have to get up and walk away for extended periods of time. Yeah. Uh, but these days, uh, you work on fun projects. Um, you've been on our site showing off Way some to cool pull it back pinball together. P- pinball projects, pinball enthusiasts. Um, your our connection into the pinball world. I am a member of the San Francisco Pinball Department. I Whoa! Felt, I saw pinball at CES, and I thought that I knew what I was talking about when I was talking to the pinball dudes because of, of our conversations about pinball. Well, you know a lot about pinball anyway. I know about old pinball. I don't know anything about new pinball. Yeah, yeah we chatted with uh, Gary Stern of yeah, I saw Stern yeah. at, at pinball at uh, CES about pinball. Yep, love pinball. Love making stuff. Love games. Love this show. It's all good. You're uh, love podcasting. You're a podcast aficionado. Podcasts are great. Yeah. You, um, so you have a new project. We can talk about it now if you want. Or we can save for the end for plugs, whatever you want. Do you want to talk about it now? Or you want to wait until the, later when there's more stuff to announce? No, let's wait till later. We should have discussed this probably before we started the show. It, it seems. I, don't have to, I don't have it here, but we can talk okay. about it later. Okay. Um, so, yeah, kind of a big news week, kind of a slow news week. Uh, we're not introducing Jeremy again. That's the one. That's the canonical introduction of Jeremy now. 
So if you missed Go it. Go back to 199. People give you, like, bookmark that. Give them shortcuts directly to that when they want to know who the hell is this Jeremy guy. Um, big news. A lot, a lot, a couple of big things. A bunch of small stuff. Uh, Stephen Hawking this week said that black holes don't exist. Right. Inescapable black holes. Yes. He said that the black hole that he postulated in the 70s and uh, with with the event horizon beyond which no information can escape, light or matter. It's inconsistent with quantum theory. Yes, that is absolutely correct. Who in this room understands quantum theory? I, I understood the first two sentences of this, which I thought were pretty good. Black holes don't exist. So uh, black hole, a, uh, a collapsed star, a, a uh, singularity, a point at which... Uh, a, of infinite mass it, is that it was the original pitch but that's infinite, not really but like, yeah. no, it was infinite <laughs> in, in, infinite mass yeah a point of a it's a singularity is the idea infinite mass in the universe uh lots of i was gonna say lots of mass a very dense point in which gravitational pull uh you could not escape basically if if the universe is a rubber sheet right and planets are marbles on that rubber sheet a uh, black hole is an anvil on the rubber sheet. The but there's the no floor. Yeah, it's a tiny anvil, but really heavy. So, yeah, there we go. Um, he, I, I read the article. I understood maybe maybe 25, 30%. So uh, why, uh, why is the concept of the event horizon a so interesting movie? <laughs> uh, why, why is the concept of that inconsistent with quantum theory? So there are a couple of theories about um, – there are a couple of ways to reconcile the quantum theory and the event horizon. Uh, one is that um, – is this thing called the firewall, the black hole firewall par- par- paradox, which basically says – it's a thought experiment that any astronaut unlikely enough to – I'm paraphrasing from the Nature article now. Uh, any a- astronaut unlikely enough to fall into a black hole um, – I'm in the wrong section here, sorry – uh invisible boundary black hole and classical theory um i don't know you should read the article if you're interested <laughs> in this. it's too it's too like now, there's no way i'm going to paraphrase this without making an ass of myself now, so i heard that if an astronaut were to fall into a black hole yes that they would stretch because the the parts of their body that are closer to the black hole would be sucked in faster than right. the parts that but, were away. But because and so it's, they, they would bifurcate. But because it's all relative, again and they again wouldn't and again. feel like it wouldn't feel like you were stretching. It's not like you'd be you're, put in a You're not you know, Mr. In Fantastic. A, in a, a vice not a vice. Uh, what are those? Uh, 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 oh, uh, the rack? The rack. Yeah. Rack. rack. That was a magic card. Really? Yes. <laughs> We're not so talking that, about magic again this first, week. <laughs> it was actually a thing it, before the magic card. Th- that's true. <laughs> um it's 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 not like if you were putting a rack and it's torn apart because the neurons move slower as your, you know, th- your feeling also stretches the, the sense you know the sensation of the, the electrical signals also slow down, um, and so I th- what I thought the thing about black holes I always thought interesting getting closer to the event horizon and getting sucked in a black hole is because of the time distortion effects of special relativity uh, that. Things in black hole, you move as you get closer to the singularity, you are slowing down. Time slows down for you, right? Uh, or conversely, relatively, the universe moves faster on the outside. Mm-hmm. Everything outside the black hole is moving faster. So as you get closer, if you can still, if those signals are still reaching your brain and you're still processing, you would see the end of the universe because time would eventually slow. I down don't think that that I don't think that holds up in a quantum mechanical world, though. Well, maybe this is what. Stephen Hawking so, says is is not consistent. Okay, so the idea here is that the idea of the event horizon is that once you cross that, you, nothing can get out. Um, there is Hawking radiation that's spewed out. It's a byproduct of stuff going into the black hole at, at speeds or something. I don't understand that stuff. It seems really confusing. Hawking radiation. Um, it's named after Stephen Hawking. It's not H-O-C-K. No, no, no. Um, it's not about Clint Hawking either, so it's sorry. The, it's but. not the black hole Hawking radiation. Um the idea here is that with this new idea, this thing called a, an, a um, called an appearance appearance horizon, apparent horizon, is that 
uh, the black hole can slowly shrink, spews out Hawking radiation, and if that is the case, the event horizon would become. This is the old theory. The black eyes, the event horizon would become smaller than the apparent horizon, and the apparent horizon is a surface along which light rays attempting to rush away from the black hole's core will be suspended. So that's the place that the light stops. The information leaving the black hole stops. The event horizon is the is the in. So it's like a supermarket. The event horizon is the indoor. Beyond which, like, once you go in that indoor, the sensor is not going to open on the other side. But the apparent horizon is the other side. So how far out from the black hole it can get before like a, it reaches. Like a, like a crab cage. Yeah, kind of. It's exactly. <laughs> it's black a, it's holes, a, on one hand, like a supermarket. This is, on the other hand, kind of like a crab cage. This is what the Tested Podcast delivers every <laughs> yeah. week. So uh, I think this is all just, um, I, I, I want to say it's viral marketing for Interstellar. You think so? What? Steve, uh, Christopher Nolan's next oh, movie, yeah, Interstellar, yeah, yeah. which uh, Kip Thorne, I want to say, is a consultant on. Mm-hmm. Who's uh, Kip Thorne? Uh, he is a, uh, a physicist uh, <laughs> who has written great books about uh, like, uh, black holes like and, pop and gravitational physics and astrophysics. Okay. But isn't part of what Hawking is now saying that something can escape a black hole? Yes, that's the point. Yeah. That's the gist. Yeah. Uh, however, uh, plot, the plot, the process... For- from yeah, science fiction writers everywhere. Sorry, sorry Event Horizon. Um, turns out it wasn't a documentary. Um, I guess start, it works. Start, all, you gotta, all you gotta do is uh, eject the warp core. Eject the warp core, and you're you gonna go fast the right around the edge, and the gravity is gonna speed you back through time. Um, and then you just have the whales. So the idea is still that if something goes like, it doesn't mean that you could shoot an astronaut into a black hole like Ernest Borgnine in the 1970s classic, The Black Hole. Um, and then they'd come out unscathed after having a magical journey through a foreign time and place. Uh, the idea is that anything that goes in is going to be so inutterably scrambled by entropy that it will be maybe not completely unrecognizable. It'll be like the transporter accident in Star Trek, the motion picture. Yeah. Yeah, where Kirk's ex-girlfriend gets, gets sizzled. Yeah, it'd be all messed up. But yeah. what about light? Did they address that? Why can't light get back out? Because light, light, light's... Does, does light get distorted? I, I think that everything that goes in, I'm, Amazing. Not, I'm not Stephen Hawking, but I think <laughs> if my understanding of co- college physics 200 is pretty good uh, from 30 years ago, 20 years ago, that, yeah, probably That's light's going to be jacked up. Interesting. Next up, explain dark matter. Can we, talk about the, can we talk about the beavers? Tell me about the beavers, Norm. I, I don't know Do you know about the beavers? About. I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. The first wild beaver sighting in Great Britain in the last 800 years happened this week. Nice beaver. <laughs> no. The nope, U- nope, Eurasian nope. beaver has returned to Great Britain. And it's... We are always at war with Eurasian beavers. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it was hunted to extinction because of its luscious pelt. As we can attest, we both handled Winston. He feels wonderful. Mm-hmm. I would totally wear beaver clothes. Who is Winston? Winston is Adam's beaver. Oh, wow. He's the mascot of the talking room. <laughs> did, you not watch, did you not watch the video about the making of Adam's beaver box? No. He made a box for Winston, his I'll, beaver. I'll go back and watch So this. that we can, he can take him, we can take him on the airplane. Norm's checked him on, uh, carried him onto an airplane before. Fantastic. He was the keeper of Winston for a while. <laughs> That's a big Custodian. responsibility. Um, they, uh, yeah, it hunted to extinction almost 800 years ago. Uh, but like Jurassic, like the plot of Jurassic Park 3, life found a way. And one of the beavers that they had in captivity, the theory is, escaped. Uh, three of them escaped a few years ago. Perhaps they bred while they were out in the wild before they were recaptured. And now the progeny of that first beaver, the the Adam and Eve of Great British beavers, uh, has uh, started to spread across the mm. the great nation. What happened to the Lilith of that? I don't know who Lilith is. I didn't. I'm it's not Adam's really first religious. wife. Oh, good to know. Mother post, of all post, demons. Post Eve. Uh, before Eve. Pre Eve. Pre Eve. Um, the irony, of course, is that the beaver was found near the River Otter, ah. which is actually a river in England. It's not a river otter. I was like, oh, it's like the wind in the willows. I don't think that's irony. Otters and beavers are similar, but they're not the same. It's, it's the interesting coincidence. It's a little bit ironic. There's initiatives to rewild lions in the U.S. It's a fucking terrible idea. Did you know that? Yeah. Mountain li- We already have mountain lions. They're scary enough. Yeah. There's mountain lions back back by uh, Frontierland. Bane of hikers everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I've seen them up in Marin. I, I guess I didn't know yeah. they were down there, too. No, we have them. I would we, have assumed so. We hear them at night sometimes in, really? the, in the mating season. Locky they make doors. Sounds like, a, like the largest, angriest house cat you've ever heard. Really? You know, speaking of um, Jurassic Park, did you guys see the auction? 
Yes! For the, uh, the, the, the raptor cage. Clever girl. <laughs> it wasn't the clever girl. It was the opening of Jurassic Park. I know, Park. but it's, this, it's the same raptor. Yeah, I'm going to go with Will on that. Is it the same raptor? I'm going to say it. Yeah. There's six raptors. You're going to say... The, gonna, you're gonna s- the only guy who didn't get an action figure? No, he got what? an action who didn't get? There was only one person who didn't get an action figure in uh, Jurassic Park. Uh, I think Nedry. Was, it might have been Sam Jackson. It was either him or the. It's probably Sam Jackson. Yeah, I think it was Sam Jackson. Um, yeah, but the, the raptor cage for did, sale. Did that sell, or is it still up? I, it seems like it got bit up by crazy people yeah. or fakers, because it was. It went from like four grand to a hundred grand in maybe two hours. Silly. Um, I mean, that happened a lot this week. Uh, there was a Nintendo cartridge that the got bit up Nintendo to... The Nintendo World Conference one, the gray one? The gray cartridge that went up to $100,000, but eventually was only really sold for about $18,000. Um, but yeah. The Jurassic Park action figure situation... Oh, no, these are dumb. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> they're, from, they're from Turkey. Um, uh, Turkish action, action figures are my new favorite kind of action figures, by the way. Uh, while, we're do, while we're doing science talk, I got one more science story. If, you, if we were done talking about beavers and Jurassic Park. Okay. Did you see the Mars mystery rock? Nope. The Mars, you know, the oh. Opportunity Rover. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. It's been trucking around Mars for 10 years now. Dun, dun, dun. It's amazing. Um, one day, they fired up the cameras, looked at the night's take, and they were like, wait. There's something new here. Something's changed. Yeah. Which, you know, if you're here, it's not that unusual. Like, you walk down the street to our office. One day, there's nothing there. The next day, there's human feces. The day after that, there's a hypodermic. <laughs> like, that's just, it's just a cost of doing business in a world filled with life. But Mars, <laughs> devoid of life, has, like, every, like, what the fuck is this? How did this happen? Did something fall off of the rover? Did we kick up some dirt someplace going at a tenth of a mile an hour? Or did maybe a meteorite impact nearby as, you know, like an Empire Strikes Back at the beginning it was really the, the probe droid? Uh, and then knock up some rock from a, around the area and it just happened to land I'm gonna think right next to our rover. Camera sensor data problems in the imagery. Oh, you guys, am I the only one that wants to believe it was put there? By timid Martian life forms. I don't think <laughs> approaching that's... A, a gesture of peace. Here's a here's a fancy rock. Just to see what happens. Uh, yeah. if, if it's anything, it's Martian life forms putting it there just to fuck with us. <laughs> Look, this stupid robot only goes a tenth of a mile an hour. Just to be clear, I don't think the robot is stupid. I think it's really an amazing technological <laughs> feat, and it's great that it's lasted ten years. But if I was a ro- if I was a Martian, and I was sitting there, I was like, oh, tenth of a mile an hour really this is the best you can do. Seven billion people on that planet. Come on. Take Pick it. up the speed, guys. Baby steps. Baby steps. That's that's a good that's a good baby step, Sally. Baby what, steps. what is that? It's from uh, Contact. Oh yeah, the end of Contact. I didn't mean that though. Can't I, take I, credit. In, in my head, you that's you did. Um, I like that movie much more when I watched it again last year than I did when I saw it in the movie theater. I in always love that movie. I know you always have perfect taste, Norm. Yes, um, absolutely. Uh, speaking of space robots, uh, China's oh, we, space we're robot done with the robot. The, the rock, they don't know what it is. Some crazy guy sued them and said that it's fungus. What? Why, are you serious? Why would yeah. they sue them? Because uh, he thought that, they, that, he, that NASA contaminated Mars and is withholding information. It's a, it's a, he's a nutball, it seems like. You don't say. Yeah. Um, but they don't know what the rock is. That's, that's the upshot. They're working. They're looking more into it, and they've given it a name. Yeah. I don't remember what the name is. It was, it was something inspirational, I'm sure. So on Mars, a rock moved... And a robot's been staring at it. I think a rock appeared. It didn't a move. Rock, well, it clearly moved to there. But we didn't see it move. It could have just it could have just <laughs> substantiated from nothing. Okay. Maybe it was ejected from a black hole across the universe. Well, laugh at me for my Martian theory. It's <laughs> but now the Martian robot is yeah. staring at it for a week. Because that's that's yeah. all it's doing. It's just this is very interesting. Just gonna and see it looks, if it moves again. And it looks like a jelly donut. <laughs> it, it does look kind of like a shiny jelly donut. That's the worst analogy. I mean, the nice thing is it's a side of a rock that we don't normally get to see because that that robot can't really do a whole. lot. It doesn't have an arm, really. Oh, I guess it has a little arm. Maybe some, I can't remember. Like drills and things. I don't know if those still work though. They it might be working on reduced oh, power is these that, days. Is that a fact? So while our Opportunity rover has been on Mars for ten years, a decade. Um, what were you doing 10 years ago when the Opportunity Rover landed? You were in college still, right? I was doing yes. World of Warcraft undoubtedly. <laughs> that's, uh, that's definitely true. Uh, China's robot on the moon has died. It lasted, what, a week and a half? Something like that. Uh, the Jade Rabbit rover uh, had mechanical problems, and uh, the 
their space agency issued a, a report written in the voice of the rover saying that he might not, it's the robot, I don't know if it's, it might not survive the lunar night. Goodbye, humanity. How long is the lunar night? Is it, because is, it's tightly locked, it's probably 30 days, right? That sounds about right. Because yeah. the same face always faces us, so that yeah. means I it like takes 28 days to rotate. You're, you're watching it happen every night. Yeah. 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 I'm going to look that up. Um, and uh, the robot, the rabbit could freeze to death. I don't, I would think you'd put heaters on that. Oh, mm, yeah. They need to hibernate. Oh, no. A complete lunar day is 29.5 Earth days. So a lunar night is half of that. Made one of the, the classic blunders. <laughs> 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 Um, where where was that rover? Is it on the dark? Is it on the far side, or is that on the side that we see? I would think it'd be in the light side. Light side. Well, there, there's no light side and dark side. They're on the side that we see. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, because we don't have any lunar. Yeah, but on the dark. Does the dark satellite. side? The dark side never gets light. No, the dark no, no, side. No, 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 no. The dark side is it's a misnomer. It, is that the true? Side, yeah. We always see one face. Yeah, and that face becomes dark and light. Mm-hmm. Depending on its orientation but relative if, to us if and you, the sun, yeah. If we have a so half the, moon, so there's when you when people say dark side, they just mean the side dark to us, the side that Earth never sees unless we're on the other side of the moon. Mm. But it's that like, side does get light, you know, when okay. when we see the moon in darkness. Because if we if we see half the moon, then the other half that we don't see on the on the far side is yeah. being lit. So far side of the moon, as opposed to dark side yeah. of the moon. It's like when Jack Bauer says to Chloe, "Chloe, I'm going dark." He doesn't mean he's really turning off the lights. He means he's turning off his phone. Well, not so just we can't to, see just it. to be clear, on a new moon, yeah. when it's it's fully dark, that means it's full on the other side. No, yeah. If that were the case, then the sun would be on the other side of the moon. Not necessarily. Yeah, it would be an eclipse. It would be a, a, a solar eclipse. No, it could just mean that the moon is on the moon. So here's us. This is going to be great for the audio listeners. I'm holding my hand in yep. the air. Yep. That's the Earth. He can be the sun. Norm is the sun. Yep. So all that means is that the moon is Radiant, here. Life giving. And what if it's where you are? That would be then that we see that's a lunar eclipse. No, if the moon is where we are, no, put the moon. But where the you axes are. aren't exactly <laughs> no. right. If the <laughs> okay, so this is the Earth now, and this yeah. one's the moon. Yeah. Then then we see a full moon here. Here it's a new moon. Yeah, and in that case, the the moon's getting no sun. But but you have to. It's un, It's an unusual occurrence that it lines up exactly right. All right. This is this this is the experience best. I think told science in planetarium form i think the science talk is probably over i think we've we peak science here um the big tech news this week uh Motorola google uh, google sold now, Motorola. Uh, google has promised to sell Motorola, has made a deal to sell Motorola to lenovo 2.91 billion dollars what did they pay for Speaking Motorola of new two years for ago? chinese companies uh they paid 12 billion holy shit 12.5 billion. So they've lost $9 billion in, what, they, two or three years? They also retain all the patents. Those patents Most seem a lot patents. less valuable now that everybody's cross-licensing everything, huh? Uh, I think the patents were, they needed them at that time. Seemed like uh, a good idea at the time. Uh, Motorola had been operating at a loss of close to a billion dollars a year anyway. Oh, so, so then they're saving money. And also Google is keeping uh, the, the Skunk Works, the moonshot division of Motorola. There wasn't really a moonshot. The people that made the Moto X. No, the Moonshot Division of Motorola did the animation thing for the Moto X, that that augmented reality animation app thing. Oh, um, not the actual Moto X. Oh, everything what hardware about the voice thing, hardware stuff all going to to Lenovo. Um, Jeremy just tuned out because we started talking about Android stuff. We lost him. Sorry, I'm, I'm I'm still stuck on the Moon thing. I'm not done. Oh, okay, uh, <laughs> I think it's a great move for uh, Lenovo. They've always wanted to get into. Uh, smartphones in the U.S. Yeah, I think this is much better than doing Windows phones for them. And um, they've had Android phones in the past running Intel chips, the K900, I believe. They had a TV um, that ran Android too, didn't they? Didn't we see that? At, yes. It was in Hong Kong only or something? Um, and they definitely have money, a lot of money. They're one of the largest PC manufacturers right now, traditional Windows PCs. Uh, they're going to keep the Motorola brand. They need to. It makes sense for them. It makes them giving them an opportunity to move to buy a lot of expertise in a market that they need to be into and aren't is is a good thing. I just don't know how people who work in Motorola feel about that. Right uh, well, I'm sure a lot of them probably won't work for Motorola for long if they if they don't like it. So, um, 
Anything else? I feel like that's pretty much that like was, that story it was, is pretty it much was it. Sudden that's and your big. big. That's your biggest story of the week. That was the biggest story. It's not. A, it's not. A, this, week. It's shallow. It's a. It's a big story. <laughs> there it is. But it's like there's not a whole lot of nuance oh, there. Man. It's like either going to be good or bad, and we don't know for a long time. It's trouble for this podcast. Well, you know, it's, it's, we. What's 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 the status of the moon thing? The other, the other uh, moonshots <laughs> okay. thing. I'm sorry for Motorola. Was they also did that um, the uh, modular phone concept. Oh, the phone blocks, but not the phone blocks. Not phone blocks. Yeah. Working with the phone blocks guy, ATAP yeah. is what it was called. Yeah. Project um, Aura. I'm sorry. Project Aura. There was another high profile hack uh, from somebody who wanted to steal a, 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 an early Twitter account. Uh, the, the person's Twitter account was at N. Uh, and it was another social engineering hack similar to the Matt Honan one from last year that we talked about, uh, what, last, like September or August or something. Uh, this one... They called PayPal, got the last social engineered the last four digits of the person's credit card from PayPal by pretending to be an employee. By pretending to be a PayPal employee, right? He just said employee, but that's I what I assume PayPal too. employee. Yeah. So some someone who wanted this Twitter handle yes. at N, yes. and solely wanted the Twitter handle, found a way to blackmail the owner of that by hacking that person's PayPal account. Well, no, they didn't hack the pay- 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 PayPal account. They social engineered the PayPal account to and get then their, used to that get, to get the last four digits of that dude's credit card right. number and use that to take over his GoDaddy domain. That's the that's the part that's really which routed his email. Okay, just to be clear, there's two things that are bad here: the fact that PayPal was just like, "Yeah, here's the last four digits of the, of the credit card." Great, that's awful, really bad. That's the same way. This is the same thing happened to Matt Honan, uh, except with Amazon handed over the last four digits of the credit card. Um, and then the other part of it is that uh, GoDaddy transferred the domain registration with no kind of questions. Well, they, they, they transferred they, it once he, the the hacker gave the last four digits and then guessed the first two digits. Multiple times. Multiple 99 times. 99 chances. <laughs> on the is, first call. On so, the first call. Jeremy, what are the first two digits of my credit card number? This you get your- 10 guesses. <laughs> uh, nine, five. Nope. I lost that card. I don't have it here anymore. Is it one nine? Nope. Four eight? Nope. Four three? Nope. Four six? This is not funny anymore. <laughs> but <laughs> imagine the telephone call where four, six, that's wasn't exact it? nope. Where that's exactly what happened. And this this person was able to guess. What kind I, of I thought that the first two digits were consistent, like based on the master or visa. I th- I think I think that is absolutely you can the case. Definitely so like, track them. It, like my MasterCards are both five four. So I'm sure my visa. Is. No, it's, it's uh, the the. I'm not going to say, but the first the <laughs> first should, eight numbers. You made mistakes, Jeremy. I, no, but this is consistent. <laughs> the first eight numbers People. are your visa indicate visa and the bank. Exactly, is my understanding. So a flawed or system. First five numbers. Absolutely, something. Jeremy. Mine is also five four. We're in the same boat now. Same there bank. Are. There you are. I'm same, a different. Mine same, are not five same, four. Uh, same uh, Mastercard. Um, so. So yeah, uh, the guy, once they did that, they called him. They reached out to him via some sort of communication format and said, "Look, we have your GoDaddy accounts." They couldn't actually get Twitter to to change the account over um, because he had two factor authentication set up. I think I, they, they basically they they took over GoDaddy because they wanted the email accounts, the access to his email address that was that the Twitter address was set up to. But it was, yeah. He described the interactions on Facebook, the bla- the actual blackmailing process, and uh, these these hackers were very cordial and very straight to the point. It was um, it was transactional. It was very transactional, a, f- a formal transaction. Hey, we um, have your domain registration. We haven't fucked anything up yet, but if you don't give us your Twitter account, we're going to fuck up all of the clients and work that you've done on a bunch of different domains. Here's exactly how you can hand it over. Yeah. So he, he, he was like, he, he reached out to GoDaddy to try to get his, his domain stuff back. And they basically told him to pound sand. They couldn't verify that it was him. Um, or, or, or didn't he reached out to Twitter, who didn't respond. And finally, he was like, look, I have no choice. I got to do this. So, and hasn't tweeted yet. Is he? I thought he got it back. He didn't get it back. They, they and his stolen is still, is still a. Him. When you type twitter.com slash n, it always goes to Nicki Minaj's web Twitter page, which makes me sad. Um, but what happened last night was the people who took the n account initially, because what happened is he changed his Twitter username, because you can change your Twitter username. I could change my Will Smith to Bob Johnson if that was available. 
So he set up the transaction. He changed his Twitter name to something that wasn't N and is stolen. And they changed the Twitter handle that they wanted onto that to at N. Last night, the person who was on the at N vacated. And this new person whose name is Follow Betel News uh, jumped onto it before he could get it back. So, like, there's layers upon layers of drama here. Wow. The reason we're talking about this isn't because the Twitter... Twitter account law. I mean, that sucks for that guy. It's really a bummer. He was offered, by the way, fifty thousand dollars previously. Yeah, for this account, legitimately. I feel like that's a reasonable number for a one. I think Twitter that he, account. I think that he shouldn't have called it a his his big medium post was oh my my fifty thousand dollar my fifty thousand. You didn't lose fifty grand. You lost fifty grand when you turned down selling your Twitter account. So yes, you just lost your Twitter account. Yes, I'm just saying it was a valuable account. I think the Twitter. It's I think only as valuable as as. If when he could have made that when he had he posted, it. hey, I lost my Twitter account, nobody would have retweeted it. Yeah. Like by saying it was a fifty thousand dollar Twitter <laughs> account, everybody looked at the story to see what a fifty thousand dollar Twitter account was. It was it was a good headline. Although a little sensational. So the reason we're talking about this though is to talk about how you protect yourself from this sort of attack. Um it seems like like had he been hosting had he had all of his accounts attached to say Gmail or a email service that offers two factor authentication. Um are you guys looking at viewing pictures again? <laughs> uh I don't think that girl was in Star Wars. <laughs> uh had he had his account tied to a service provider that offers two factor authentication and that the domain is relatively untouchable. Like I don't think I don't think anybody's gonna be able to hijack Gmail dot com. I feel like I feel pretty safe about that. Why do you say that? I, you mean I, with two-factor on? No, no. I feel like nobody's going to be able to take over gmail.com oh, like from the, Google. Oh, sure. I feel like that's yeah, pretty good. But so that's, that, that's, that, that's not what happened here. No, that, that is not what happened. But uh, there was a conversation that came out of this that talked about how if you have your, um, your two-factor authentication being sent via text, then all that means is that they have to take over your phone along the way, uh, which is a little bit more of a hassle. Um, Verizon apparently is easy to socially engineer right now. There, there are methods out that, like, they claimed that there are methods out that let them take over a Verizon account. Um, it's tough because I mean the way the reason social engineering works because there are a, a large population of people out there who are not technically proficient who just need that convenience, and there are not a lot of ways. I mean, if if my mom calls and you get very easily frustrated. You don't have all the right documents. If you know the last four digits of somebody's social security number and their credit card numbers and their home address and their full name and their date of birth. And their mother's maiden name. And their mother's maiden name. And the elementary school they went to in the name of their first dog, which is probably Pepper. It's always Pepper. Um, it's it's like it's easy to call someplace. It's, it's hard to not identify that person as that person. Um, so the same stuff applies to the Matt Honan hack for the most part. Use... Um, Use two factor. Have everything go through a Gmail account is what I is what we re recommend. That has two factor authentication turned on. Use the Authenticator app, not the um, not the uh, text, text message. messages. Uh, make sure you have the printouts of your recovery codes because the the first time you turn on two factor, if you save those codes and you print them out, Google will authenticate you back all the way back to those. Even if somebody manages to bypass your two factor and all that other stuff. Um, is at least that's what we've been told. I haven't obviously I haven't tested that. Um, use uh, a hosting provider that doesn't suck ass like GoDaddy, uh, a domain registrar. A lot of people recommend Hover. Um, don't do network solutions. Don't do network solutions. They're they're rip off artists these days. Well, part of the problem here was that GoDaddy isn't just the registrar; they're also the host, and so yes. and his email provider. So it was like a one stop shop for everything. Yeah. Whereas Hover is just a just registrar. A, yeah. So then you have to point to Google Apps for your domain or something like that. Um, one of the things that that he had suggested was if you are if you are want to host your if you do want to use your email your own email domain for this kind of stuff, which is not recommended then uh, to set the mail, the DNS timeout for new mail record changes to like a week rather than five hours. So what that means is that it'll take a week for changes to that stuff to take place rather than four or five hours, which is I think what happened to him. That would have given him more time before they could they could get the GoDaddy stuff um, to, you know, that he would have access to his old email. 
that he would actually have access to the email account. Um, but yeah. And then uh, use one use credit cards for really important stuff. Gosh. One so, use credit cards. So if that's he, a hassle. For example, if he had had a one off credit card hooked up to that GoDaddy wow, account, it's a burner. It, yeah, it's totally a burner card. Uh, most big banks will issue those on a handful a month for free. Um, anytime you buy something from someplace that's questionable, I usually recommend doing those. Like whenever I buy arcade sticks from some little place in Southeast Asia, I totally use really? a burner number. Cool. Yeah. Um, um, I I don't feel like that. I mean, obviously, using two factor at Google is going to be a good move. But if somebody gets into your account, into your primary e email account, they're likely to get all the information that that they need to do anything else. Well, that's why that primary email account. Like, so here's the thing. That, the other thing we learned from the Matt Honan hack is that he had a chain of accounts that were all connected to each other, and that all they had to do was break the the easiest one, which was I think the iCloud account at that time. Uh, and and that gave him that that because that was the recovery address for Gmail. Yeah, that gave them instant access to his Gmail, which then fucked the whole thing up. Um, so the thing is, you have to look for those points of failure. You don't want to point your Gmail account to a a less secure recovery address because then it's, all they have to do is bypass is right. get get to that. Um, <clears throat> like protecting that main email address it seems to be the best way to protect yourself. Good thing Google owns it. Yeah, I mean, the, then the question is, how much do you trust Google? How much can you really trust anyone? As far as I can throw them. Um, do you want to talk about, uh, do, you, do either of you have a, have a POTS line, an old-fashioned two-wire copper phone line coming into your house? Yes, negative. Not activated, but the line does come in. But you don't have any, there's, is no there service. electricity on it? Can you plug it in? Do you oh, get yeah. a dial tone? Yep. So you could pick, you could plug a phone into that and dial nine one one if you had to. Yes, in in case of blackouts, it still works. And essentially, any phone that was put in that was made since the sixties will plug into that that RJ eleven port and work. Thank rotary, you, Bell Labs. Rotary, um, and a, a digital touch tone. touch tone. That's what it's touch called. Tone. Yeah, touch touch tone. hyphen tone capital. Really. That's capital the brand T, name. Capital T. Yep. Touch I think they left Bell that, Labs. I think they probably let it lapse. That brand, you know, that trademark lapsed. Um, AT&T and some of the other telcos are moving forward with plans with the FCC to deactivate the old switched phone network, which is that POTS line, that, that thing that you pick up, you dial the 10-digit number, you call any place in the world, it connects with a, used to be, you know, somebody plugging in wires, but now it's all automated. What happened to all the operators? There, are, there aren't, they, they'll work in a call, there's nothing, the call center will just have different phones coming oh, into no. it. Um the the plan has been tentatively approved by the FCC. There are a lot of requirements that involve keeping existing services running because there are a great many services that rely on on analog phone lines still, uh, from fax machines on up to like fire alarms, smoke alarms, burglar alarms, um, healthcare monitoring stuff. All there's all sorts of stuff that actually like people could die if it doesn't work right. Sometimes I just want to listen to that tone. It's a soothing tone. It's a good noise. Mm, it's very difficult to replicate. You know, it's also. a chord. It, it is. is. It yeah. is a cord. Yeah. As are all the buttons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, 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 a, it's purely analog also. Um, yeah. And, and not something that you can you is, know, digitize. Has anybody ever told the story of the touch tone, the dial tone? Yes. It's interesting. I've never read that article. There's a book actually. about it. A New York Times did a story about it okay. two weeks ago. Ars Technica had a nice article about BBS modems, and they had a nice graph. It was a scan of the sound frequencies of touch tones, and, oh, like, then, and then modems talking. Yeah. And annotated... Really cool. annotated um, Bottom speak. Yeah. How, how computers talk to each other. Exactly. You saw it. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I was going to say, uh, that's sad for the telephone. Did you guys watch the uh, that Steve Jobs uh, Sorry, first telephone. keynote? <laughs> no, no. I'm going to bring it back. To Steve Jobs, his first uh, public debut of the Mac, which turned 30 uh, last I, week. No, this week. That, it was a second. I, that video has been out. It just got, it resurfaced or something. I mean, I've you're seen You're talking that. about the Boston... Convention one. I'm the Boston about, Mac World is what it was, the, I think. Or uh, no, it was it was a Mac a, World. It was a it was a investors. No, no. Thing. See, that, that, there's where we're talking about different things. The investors uh, meeting where he did the presentation for the investors. Right. That was the legit first vi first introduction of the Mac. Okay. What are you talking about? So after that, but that was a private meeting, and while there is video of that, he didn't. That wasn't um, him presenting to the public. And that was actually January 29th. So after the Super Bowl ad, right? 
uh, the video that surfaced more recently, and it was archived by the Computer History Museum, and I think here McCracken over at Time Magazine was the one who wrote about this. He was a member of that club in Boston, uh, was the first public keynote introducing the Macintosh. And so, that was so. This was like a homebrew computer club. Well, it was post way Apple more II, of a post but, XT and all that. I mean, that we're still right? talking about hundreds of people, hundreds and thousands of people in a room, very much like an Apple keynote today, but done you know thirty years ago. Um, and CNN wasn't there. Yes, yes, and people recording it, like Apple recorded it, and fans recorded it, and that's where this footage comes from. Uh, it's it's being restored and it will be made public, I think, by the Computer History Museum. But it's online right now. You can stream it, and it's really interesting because I had seen the, uh, the investor one, investor call one, which is a fine presentation. Yeah, he talks um, about that. The they talk about them in the Walter Isaacson book at length. And this 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 one is just the second revision of that. It was as if the investor call uh, investor presentation was the practice run for is this public one. Because he gets much better feedback. It's all about the crowd response, as you would see in Steve Jobs keynotes in the you know the th late thousands um he's still very unpolished as a presenter it was back a then. kinder gentler time back then um he, he rushes through the the introduction but in his introduction he talks about the macintosh being the first desktop appliance since the telephone uh he defines desktop appliance as something that's essential that you that's worthy of putting on your desk and before computers, it was the telephone, um, not the picture phone that Bell Labs wanted to in introduce. But then after that, he thought the computer would be the next desktop appliance and did eventually become the, the primary yeah, desktop appliance. Not, there's not very many desks, uh, work desks that don't have a computer don't on have computers. them. And now we're moving to work desks that don't have computers on them because they are either laptops that you take home with you that don't have the That's stationary still, computer. I think that still counts as a still computer. computer. And then some people just work on phones. And tablets. I mean, I, I know a lot of people who are in like sales industry who just use their phone and iPad. Yeah. For if they're on Salesforce or something like that. So the, the idea of this desktop appliance, what is essential for your productivity? You know, if it goes from, I guess, drafting paper and, and pen and inkwells. Typewriters. To typewriters to telephones and then to computers and then who knows what next. Don't forget the fax machine, Norm. I don't know if people actually had fax machines on their home desk. So we're we gonna roll that back around AT and T somehow. Phones. Oh yeah, phones, telephones, telephones. Um, I don't feel like you finished the story. That's pretty much it. Was there? They're just gonna kill it's a, it. There's a three stage process. <laughs> so, um, but there's gonna be some sort of a way to su backwards support the old stuff. So, I would assume, that, like the the FCC mandate is basically not that FCC mandates are seem to be worth shit these days, but the FCC mandate is that it has to anything they do has to support. All everything like hundred percent coverage of things that are covered by the POTS network now. Got it. So um, that means that they have to solve the rural problem where there's no broadband. Um, you know, they they have to they have to. It may involve replacing stuff at like the the D slam level in every neighborhood in the country. It may involve replacing stuff at the central switching locations. No, we don't really know. Um, but if you, if you've ever had a chance to go inside one of those. Um, one of those big switching stations for a phone network. Um, like when you drive around a city, especially a larger city, occasionally you'll just see a building that's like a concrete, it's like four concrete walls, no windows, and it'll have AT&T or, or, or um, Verizon or whatever the local phone company is in the area. And those buildings are basically like they're warehouse buildings with big open floor plans. And then the rooms are just thousands upon thousands of rooms that terminate in wires like the cable runs it's one of those places where the people who run cables in those places are are highly skilled at making the tightest possible bundle of cables because getting an extra tenth of a millimeter dia uh, uh, density out of the cable bundles makes a big difference uh, on the scale that they're talking about so i would assume that those are going to go away and instead be replaced by like one one fiber that's packet switched like a normal like an ether like like the internet basically it's like what happened to tv a, a few years ago they, where they got I, they got rid of the analog bunny ear signals but the difference is the last mile on that was over the air yeah. and here the last mile is millions and millions of i mean literally two copper wires <laughs> a twisted pair of yeah. copper wires that comes into every house in the country do they want to sell that i have no idea 
I think I think that that is a, a dead technology at the this telef- point. The, the telephone infrastructure, the copper wire infrastructure, is one of the great inventions of of uh, modern of America. I thought Google century. was buying up copper wire everywhere so that they could do their internet. I don't know about so that. Relay the same wire with fiber. Yeah, or or just repurpose it. I don't know. Um, New technologies. There's only so much you can do with that wire. Yes, there is. Um, well, but if you don't have to. Uh, if you don't have to run the phone stuff over it, then it opens up the whole different world of signal opportunities. It's not like they, it's not like DSL where they piggyback at a much higher frequency. Right, right. But it's also like there's standards on the wire. Like that's true. Some of the wires can be lower quality in certain places, just for the bare minimum. But the the seal, uh, the floor is much, the ceiling is much lower. So I mean, this could end up being a really good thing because it could force the teleco- telecoms to roll out broadband to the to the 10 percent of the country that still doesn't have broadband access um it could also be a complete disaster so i mean who knows we'll something to keep an eye on my guess i'm is hoping for clusterfuck <laughs> you, norm clearly you don't know anybody who lives in the country um it's uh it's uh probably a 10-year thing if i had to guess it'll take them a long time to to get to the point that they can turn it off if you look at how long it took from the time they started working on shutting down analog tv to how long you know it actually actually took and this is i think a much more complex problem probably to solve so um nintendo uh, nintendo had a bunch of um, financial announcements this week they did quarterly reports and all that stuff they made a little bit of money last quarter so that's good. Made revenue or profit? I think profit a little tiny bit for the quarter. They're still going to be down on the year, is my understanding. Um, I thought it was pretty grim. I thought the president fell on his sword, said he'll cut his own salary in half. I that's definitely, no literal swords. Yeah, I misjudged the mode, Western actually. market. <laughs> <laughs> Too soon. It had the little attachment. Yeah. Um, yeah. They they it's soft Wii U sales. It seems to be the blame. Um, they, they. Uh, I did my part. You bought a Wii U? Heck yeah. What have you played? Super Mario? Finished Super Mario. I haven't finished it yet. Yeah, it's, it's me and my son. We okay. played together. Um, is, he, is, he, is he competent? Is he able to play at this point? He's eight, right? Are you kidding? Yeah, I should have. I, when I was eight, I could have played the he's, shit out of Super he's Mario. He's six and he's playing the shit out of it. He's been playing Mario since he could pick up a controller. Ah. Did he, was he super interested in the controller when he was like a little tiny baby? Uh, yeah, and because Daddy was using it. But by the way, I did not introduce him to Mario. His grandma did. And then years later, she says, I wonder if that was the right thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> what, like, she's, he's at her house, and she's like, ah, I'm going to bust out the NES. Yeah. And, and That's he, great. And he expects that kind of um, gratification from life, you know, that, that, that rush that you get, that, that constant feedback exhilaration. Loop. Yeah. So huh. we'll see. Anyway, that's off topic. We didn't let our baby watch TV. We don't, she doesn't watch TV, really. We didn't let them watch TV. Yeah. But we did. The screens. We in encourage general. video games. Okay. That's good. <laughs> it's parent of the year. Um, so as a result of the forecast, they released a lot of forward-looking stuff that Nintendo kind of usually keeps under wraps. They said uh, they're not going to publish on other platforms. So everybody who's saying, hey, you should put these games on iOS, probably not going to happen, guys. Still probably not going to happen. Um, yet they don't have a Wii U price cut planned. Uh, they are not backing away from the gamepad, which is the expensive part of the Wii U. They're going to double down and make more games that take more advantage of the gamepad to make it a more valuable peripheral. Um, they are releasing Mario Kart 8 in May. It's the eighth iteration of Mario Kart. We talked, um, didn't we talk about how the hackers repurposed the uh, Wii U gamepad? No. Yeah. How have I not seen this? Oh, it was great. Oh, you talked about me while I was gone. Maybe. Was that the, did I talk no. to you about that? Well, it was one of these hacker conferences. I'm sorry. I don't know which one. but like it, Black Hat or something like that? Something, like, like scary hackers or like friendly it, hackers? It was this hackers. month, I think. It okay. was either this month or late last. And anyway, they, they, did, they worked on this for a year. Yeah. Where they deciphered. They finally figured out the codec that the thing uses to transmit video, which was a little tricky. And they learned how to interpret all the control feedback, all the Wi-Fi stuff that it does. So it uses like a Wi-Fi direct variant kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But apparently, they it's their own variant. So they, they really course. they had spent a long time trying to decrypt everything. But they have it working now. Was that the Wii U gamepad can talk to a PC exactly like the Envision, whatever it's called, the the Nvidia Shield. Nvidia Shield can do. So you can stream video from a PC and remote play. Exactly. That's and amazing. And so they're playing Nintendo, uh, I guess it was uh, GameCube emulators, streamed oh. from the PC onto the 
And all this goes back to just playing Nintendo. As opposed, so if Nintendo would just unlock yeah. that, imagine yeah. what it would do for their sales, and it's just a software change. Yeah, that kind of stuff. I, I, I think they have to look at it. Like, so they've done some interesting stuff. I think when they released Earthbound for Wii U, you could play that. Like a lot of the games that they've released, you can play that don't use both screens. You can play on just the pad, which yeah. is nice in a shared TV environment. Exactly, which is what you and I both have, and it has the headphone jack. So just like the PS4, yeah. you're, you're in your own world. Um, I find that I don't use the PS4 Vita thing very often. I just meant the headphones. Oh, okay. Headphones are cool with that. With oh, with your the, headphones yeah, yeah. into the controller. Yeah. Um, the uh, so yeah, that's the Nintendo stuff. Uh, they're they're gonna do DS games on the Virtual Console because you'll have the top screen, bottom screen split, which is kind of interesting. Like I, I could see actually playing. I don't know how many DS games I really want to go back and revisit, but I'm sure that there's some. Um, I. Somebody made a really good, uh, um, they've talked about doing like frequent buyer programs for people who buy all the first party titles so that you'll get an increasing discount the more games you buy. They kind of already do some of that stuff with the, with the N N Club Nintendo, but it's more like you get soundtracks and stuff like that for free or plushies or whatever and you buy a lot of Nintendo games and give them a lot of marketing research. Um, I, somebody made a, I, I wish I could remember who it was, but somebody made a good argument for letting the the virtual console stuff be a little bit more market driven instead of being snes games are always five dollars and nes games are always th snes games are always eight dollars nes games are always five dollars and 64 games are always ten dollars whatever um in that like if that could be market driven so that the games that are interesting like, like balloon fight should not cost five dollars it was a nes game it was great for the time it is a thing that i would totally buy if it was a buck but if it's five i'm never ever going to pick up uh, and they have a lot of stuff in the catalog like i'll happily pay five dollars for a link to the past all day long but i have no interest in paying five dollars for like arcade kind of arcade nes games basically yeah. um at least they've linked the two accounts now oh you know i mean and i that was that should have been there from the beginning they still don't have cross buy though I mean, that's one of the nicest things about the PS4 yeah. is that I bought Spelunky for the PS3 and I got it for the Vita as a result. That's cool. It's great. It's amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I feel like for Nintendo, that they're finally just they're done with that. And that was such a humongous process for them. I don't know. I'm trying to be sympathetic for why they're not doing more. But Yeah. Um, and they also have a health-focused initiative. So the Wii Fit stuff did really well for them last generation. It seems like that might be a driver for the Wii U. I don't know. They, they hope it's a driver for the Wii U. So I assume that they're looking at Fitbits and all the stuff that was at CES and thinking, oh, we can do that too. Why not? Um, Google Glass this week mm -hmm. announced four, finally, uh, four prescription lens frames for... Google the the second rev of the Google Glass Explorer edition. In addition to three sunglass. In addition to three kind of sports, unfortunate sunglass frames. Sports yes. frames. So these are you make you get these fitted with your own glass. You get these with your own lenses. So on you them. have to buy the Google you have the Google Glass Explorer edition, the second rev, which lets you unscrew the module from the titanium. The first frame. one you could unscrew the module too, but it's a different shape. It's a different mount it, point. And and the mount point now fits these new glasses that Google has designed themselves. And they're also titanium. And uh, I think ex people who are in the program got emails to buy. Nope. 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 <laughs> then Will didn't get an email to buy them. Nope. They were No email has come out about. So uh, who can buy them? They're, you just had to go to the forums. It was in the forums? Yep. And wow. by the time. Because it, it wasn't on the website. It was on The Verge. The yeah, Verge the, said, hey, you can. Th they're doing this. And then. Um, I went to the forum to see if I could. There's an accessory store for Google Glass. Oh, so if you lose your pouch, store. if you lose your power brick, if you lose any of that stuff, not made clear. Then, then you, like you just go to that same page. Um, you have to be in the program to buy them. The choices there are four frame options. There are kind of two roundish, more feminine frames, and two kind of squarish, more masculine frames. Not that I'm making gender assumptions based on the style of frames, but that was but. The default pictures for two of them were women, two of them were men. Uh, they come in, their titanium frames, they come in a basic gray color with accents for the most part. Uh, so you can buy them to match your the, your your glass unit. Um, and then the accents like on the inside edges of the frames will share the same colors. 
um, the the it's a real weird situation. I I looked at them and I ordered one and then I canceled the order. Which one? The bold in the matching. I would have gotten the matching color of the replacement one that's that's theoretically on the way, um, but they ran out of that color immediately. The one that they've sold the most of. So. Um, it's the square frames. It looks almost like my current glasses. But here's the problem. The frames only work with the glass on. So that means that you would not be able to wear these glasses as normal glasses. They have a cutout in the top right corner of the right You can't lens. wear them without the Google glass. There's no right arm on the frame without the glass attached because the glass has the whole thing. And like thinking about – I, I thought about it a little bit like how – like I need my glasses to see. I can't take them off optionally. So if I go into a movie theater, I have to leave my glasses on. You need to carry an extra pair of normal glasses. I'd have glasses. to carry an extra pair of normal glasses and a way to store these because the, the arms don't seem to bend. Um, so they're, they, you'd have to wear them. every. If you're going to wear them, it's a commitment to wear them everywhere. And if you want to take them off to charge them even, I'd have to have another pair of glasses around. Which you do have. Not I don't carry them with me though. You have oh I see what you're saying. Yeah, I only yeah. care. I mean, I only care one pair of glasses on a day to day right, basis. Right, right, right. Um, and two hundred thirty dollars. And no, two hundred seventy five dollars <laughs> plus the cost of the lenses. It was, was two twenty five. It was two seventy five. Pretty sure. Um, it ended up being three hundred dollars with tax for the frames. How many that's what lenses? that's what fancy glasses cost. Well, the lenses are variable based on your prescription, and because of the weird cutout in the top right corner of the frame where the where the glass pokes through. It seems like the lenses would probably be crazy expensive, even on top of the normal. Like my lenses are already crazy expensive because I have a bad, bad correction and astigmatism and all that stuff. So I was looking at five or six hundred dollars for the glass glasses. Not worth it. I'm like, nope, nope. Um, so Not I, worth it. Yeah. Anyway, and also the second rev of the Explorer. And I and I'm I'm not sure that like if so. Here's the thing, where I ended up was. If the second rev of the glasses has a camera that's worth using, because the reason I stopped using them in the first place is that the pictures you take with them are kind of shitty, um, like bad, bad phone cam pictures. If the camera is good enough that I would actually use it and, and want to use the pictures, then I might look at getting glasses for the second rev. But if the second rev camera isn't good enough to actually use, there's no reason to invest more in that ecosystem. They've, they've lost me, at least until the consumer version is available, hopefully with a real camera. But even then, there's social implications to wearing that thing that are challenging. What is, yeah. Norm, you found that. Yeah. Also, I didn't have to spend $1,500 on it. Yeah. Well, neither of us spent $1,500 on it. Came out of our contrib's budget. Um, so that's that. Uh, I'll be interested. The, the one thing I will say is that with the glasses on, it's much less obtrusive than the weird hoop thing that comes with it by default. Like, it looks much more... Um, it blends in a lot better, which is probably a good thing. Um, let's see. What's that? What else? Uh, Microsoft is giving $100 for PS3s if you trade them in at Microsoft stores. Subversive. You pointed something out that they, was interesting. They were doing the same thing for Xboxes when the Xbox One came out. So trade in your 360? Uh, no, no, no. You could trade it in your Xbox 360. I'm sorry. Yes, you could trade in your 360. For, for, for 100 bucks, And it could be any 360. Was, so, you, like, launch, busted ass. Many people did so. Non-working? I, I still have one of those. Working, well, but pre-Falcon. Yeah, see? Too late, though. I mean, those are, you know, 10 bucks on eBay. But, uh, yeah, 100 bucks. people were, Really? Those are 10 bucks. Oh, I guess best, they're best that's a high risk. Giving. Very high risk, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's... There you go. PS, I'm not giving up my PS3 yet. Because the PS4 isn't backwards compatible. And I'm still playing The Last of Us. Oh, you haven't finished Last of Us yet? It's, it's a good long, game. Long game. It is a long game. Um, Facebook announced yesterday their new paper app. It seems like another one of their experimental apps, like the Facebook Home thing. Oh, this or is like not poke. See, I thought it was paper. No, the paper app, the pa- fifty th- stu- uh, Studio Fifty Three, or yeah. whatever it's no. called. Yeah, no, I've been using that again. I actually quite like that app. It's the best drawing app, I think. It's pretty good. Yeah. It's have okay. you tried the pencil? Yeah. You have? I think I might have a broken pencil. Do you want to borrow mine? I have it right here, in my bag. I'd love to see if it works better. Okay. Yeah, Can I'd, you I'd change like a to... nib. Hmm? Did you change the nib in the inside? I didn't like it. No. I mean, they give you a replacement. Yeah, but same thing, right? It's the same thing. I mean, if you have yeah. a broken one. Oh, that's a good point. I could try that. Yeah. How much was the pencil? 50 bucks? 50 bucks. Six, well, if you want the wood one with the magnets, <laughs> then it's a little more. 
Um, well, sorry, so what, Facebook's what, yeah, paper is app is a new way to look at your feed that's uh, edge to edge, friendlier, better presentation, less less like window chrome around it. Uh, and it's coming out on the third. So something to look forward to if you use Facebook. I don't really use Facebook very much, so it's not that exciting to me, but I figured we should mention it. I do not okay. use Facebook either. Uh, Apple earnings call was this week. The interesting things of note there were that iPhone sales were massive. The bulk of revenues seems like the split is mostly toward the 5S rather than the 5C. They sold more iPhones this quarter than any quarter before, 51 million iPhones. I think that is tremendous for a product that was a, the mid-iPhone Mid-cycle Love, upgrade? Mid-cycle upgrade. That's amazing. Investors must have rallied, invest, invest, <laughs> invest. We don't give stock advice. Um, <laughs> I think what was more interesting is because this year they announced a second product line, the 5C, and I'm curious how well the 5C sold this year relative to how well, for example, the 5S or 4S sold last yeah, year as the, as the drop-down when there was zero marketing campaign for the 4S as the one as the $99 phone. There, no, there was marketing for the 5 just not where you're looking. Yeah, it's There's marketing not for that in... in, in sure, there they spent some money on marketing, but not yes. as in giant billboards everywhere promoting the 5C That's and television true. commercials promoting the 5C. And while people still, more people still bought the 5S. Yeah. I, yeah. Go ahead. I, 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 I have to assume that it sold comparably to the 5, the to 4S. the 4S. Yeah. Which would be a failure for the 5C. You think? Yes. Do you think they care? Do you think their margin is better on the 5C than the, than the 5S? The 4S? No. If they they, oh, they the sell more, two the products, it's absolutely better on the five C than on the on the the five S. Hundred dollars difference. Let me rephrase this: the margin on the five C is higher than it would have been on the five if had they bumped the five down. So maybe that's where. Maybe, they but they had to. It. They had to create a new tool product it. line. Yeah, I think it's worth them tooling it because they didn't have the five S is basically the same tooling as the 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 five. By the way, the stock dropped 8% the next day. Well, that always happens, dude. Not always. And, always and, happens. And then Carl Icahn invested another half billion dollars. Yeah. Who's Carl Icahn? He's the guy that wanted activist them... Activist investor. Yeah, activist investor. He's the guy that wanted them to increase their buyback program. He's been rallying, sending public letters, meeting with Tim Cook. He doesn't care about Apple. He cares about money. Yes. Yeah. He's a smart man. The, the, <laughs> if you want to make money in stocks, then you need to care about money more than products. Uh, they sold a lot of iPads also? Uh, it sold a lot of iPads. iPods disappeared. They didn't even talk about them in the investor Oof. report. Gone. Hey, and that's an interesting thing. I, like their entire, that entire product line seems to be going away from the website. It they, seem, yeah. they, they've moved um, the Apple TV yeah. into its own category now. Yeah. It, but it, so does this mean iPod Touches have disappeared too? Or are iPod Touches going to continue to exist for people who don't want for people to give to their, to their... I guess they want people to give their kids iPad minis now. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it's all iPad minis now. Which they um, make less margin on than uh, than than the iPad. Yeah, but I, I mean, they just want to get people in the ecosystem at this point. Um, I think they want people buying more hardware at th- this point. That's probably a good point. Uh, I lost my window because people are IMing me. Vinny Caravella, quit IMing me. Um, True detective. No. Any, any, go ahead. Hold on. Oh, that's everything. We talked about science stuff. The the other thing is the Mac sales. So it seems like iPad sales uh, are eating a little bit into Mac sales. They did confirm that Mac uh, OS and iOS will not be converging, and hinted at the next version of Mac OS would show that some way. So my take oh, on that. So Johnny is Ives that, is pulling back. No, my take on that is that they're finding that it, it's smarter that iOS and Mac OS will not be one OS eventually. I mean, yes, in two thousand seven they said iPod o- or iPhone OS, as it was called back then, uh, runs OS 10, right at its core to great applause, and we've patented the hell out of it. And, um, but it says to me that this year they're going to introduce Touch in Mac OS. You think? Yes. That to me says that we're not introducing Touch in Mac OS. No, it, it says to me that they are, and that's why they're not. The, the, the software is not converging. I think the minute will do Touch in its own way. The minute they mm. added Launchpad. I thought touch was coming. You know, it's just, it looks like iOS. I it's, just assume Launchpad is for my mom because she can't figure out how to work the applications menu in Finder. It looks like a touch interface to me. Well, it, yeah. I think touch is the easiest thing they could do. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, not easy from a software challenge side, but in terms of hardware, to get people to buy new Macs uh, without having to spend a lot of money on panels. Uh, higher oh, so you, th you think a Touch Air or Touch iMac is it's, a compelling product? As opposed to a Retina Air, which is a, a tougher product to do while maintaining air size. Well, and, and, and frankly, like if you and, look at and margins, if you want to boost iMac sales with people who do design work, like I, I could totally see an iMac Pro. That new iMac design is light enough that it that it could pop down, that it could go on a swivel stand, and work as like a a, a tablet slash. You know, this would be a very expensive iMac, obviously. But you know, if you had a if you had a Retina iMac with a stylus based, pressure sensitive touchscreen, a high quality one, I mean, that could be a, that could be an unbelievable product if they get the the ergonomics of it right. For for the kind of people who need to draw on a computer, yeah, that'd not be, me. That'd be cool. It's too expensive for me. Um, so I guess that does it for news. Unless we have anything else. I am going to uh, play some music, and then we'll talk about what we've been testing. How about that beaver? Great Britain's first wild beaver sighting in 800 years. That's amazing. Science. It's really great for the beaver. What do you have against the Eurasian beaver, Jeremy? I guess I should have more love for the beaver. <laughs> um... Let's see. Norm, you and I went and saw a, I guess it's a prototype that was kickstarted last year uh, from the folks at Sixth Sense. Uh, it's a it's a motion control system. Yes, yeah, so we talked about this a little bit last week, but I wanted to retouch on it because Jeremy's here, and I know you're, you have thoughts on virtual reality. Virtual reality aficionado. Yes. So Jeremy Williams. Um, enthusiast. Enthusiast. Uh, perfect topic. Uh, time to bring up STEM. Um, so you've heard of STEM, right, Jeremy? Uh, science, technology, math. Ah, uh, that's the engineering diff and different math. initiative. Thank you. Arts I too. Can Steam is, I can the, is the preferred nomenclature these days. Uh, the STEM system by Sixth Sense, the motion control scheme that uh, technology that was in the Razor Hydra. From the people yeah. who brought you yes. the Razor Hydra. Yes, yes, yes. And um, and it uses uh, electromagnetic magnetic fields, right? Um, and magnetic coils for positioning. Um, What's your take on motion control in virtual reality? I think it's what, – what's my take on it? Yeah, like what, what do you think is necessary for – do you think motion control is necessary? Do you for, think, for, for an for, immersion factor? Yes. Absolutely. Um, As, I mean, that, that – not only motion control so that you can – I think seeing your body in, in VR is going to be the first step. Are we talking but, about the Abrash thing? But presence? That's, that's not going to be enough. Yeah, sure, presence. The thing that's, that's going to push it – Beyond that, and I don't even know if Valve's kit does this, I'd be very curious to know, is some sort of real haptic feedback. But seeing your limbs in, in VR is going to be the first step. Which you can't do right now with most VR systems. The gamepad is the control for the, uh, for the Oculus. Um, and uh, people have put ca like Kinect cameras in front of them and projected in-game in software. Wow. Using the Kinect cameras, yeah. their their limbs, yeah, uh, and which which is an optical tracking system, mm -hmm. but this is talking about something attached to at, attached to your limbs, uh, which you would need software to support. They've done it with the Hydra too, where that you know right. you yeah. hold the Hydra controllers and it puts hands. In well, the and, and theoretically, if you're using one of the, I guess the does the Xbox One controller have motion sensors? It but it does, right? I can't even remember now. I don't have one. I haven't used any games that use motion sensors. No, it's not. No, no, yeah, it does. Dead Rising, you shake the controller to do stuff. I mean, are you talking um, about six-axis motion control or just... Oh, I'm talking... Okay, so I'm talking about... So if you look at the PS4 controller, which has a gyroscope and accelerometer in it... As did the PS3 controller. Yeah, you could use either of those. Like, if you if you have hands on the controller, you could almost use that to, to kinetically mimic how your arms are moving. Yeah. Because there's only a limited number of combinations of the way your arms can move and have the controller in that axis. But this is much better. Well, assuming it works. The the So we were there to see mainly a software demo. Uh, but also get some hands-on time with the actual STEM hardware, which we hadn't had yet. Um, the so th we'll describe STEM uh, still a base station. Yeah. Right? So so the part the components are a base station that generates a predictable electromagnetic field that is fairly large. In the Hydra's case, it was a couple of feet across. In this case, I think they said it was five or six feet, something like that. Eight feet across. Um, I, we they they gave two different numbers at different times in that in that talk. Um, but the idea is that the base station, there's no communication between the base station and the, the units themselves. The units have an electromagnetic, uh, three-axis electromagnetic coil, which let, lets them measure 
uh, precisely both their orientation and acceleration inside that electromagnetic field. Those units are um, modular, so you can put them into a bunch of different configurations. You could conceivably have ones that you strap onto like your wrist and and ankles to track the position of your li the, your your legs. You could put them on your thighs. To be calves, clear, it's not feet. like the size of a watch. Which it's, it's like a harmonica case. Yeah, it, it's like a. I guess that's yes. Um, it's like a, a like a like a column. It's it, those Altoid tins that are not the normal size, but the ones that the gum comes in. It's the same size as two of those stacked on top of each other. There you go. Or a harmonica case, a G, not an E or an A. And this magnetic field allows for positional tracking yes. of multiple. In so, space. so it's kind of like six axis um, yaw and orienta orientation and movement and position. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. Uh, it's a, it's almost like GPS in that you can. Uh, it's not limited. Like the the base station isn't tracking the the stem mm -hmm. units. The stem units are tracking the base station, and it's just software that allows you, the, the limits number how many stem units you have. Yeah. They'll launch with five. Um, we asked about how, how it'll integrate with the Oculus Rift and how a lot of people think the optical tracking is way to go. For example, motion capture uses optical tracking. Uh -huh. it, it'll not, launch with five. Five Mac at most support for five support for five support of for these five stem yeah. units. You can buy okay. kits from two to to five, and they haven't really announced like these wristband systems. I think they talked about like, for example, Black Widow comic book heroin uh, wristbands. They like, talked about they had a lot of prototypes, prototype um, ideas. But but we did see the the prototype we did see that you do slot one of these stem units into is a pistol grip. It's like a um, controller. Um, it's a, it's a hand, it's a trigger, there's triggers, a, a trigger and a bumper inside, almost like a nun, a weed nunchuck. Um, and then on the top, there's a analog stick with, um, six or eight buttons, I think six buttons, I guess. And with a trigger. And so you can imagine this is used for like shooting games. Mm -hmm. Well, um, they were using it for a CAD demo, right, which we'll, we'll talk about in yeah. just a moment. Uh, but in shooting games, it's, you know, it's, it's because it's mostly gyro control. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know any game that you would, uh, and, and adding translation to that changes geometry in the virtual trajectory significantly. Like even in a simulator like Arma, your mouse is moving as if it's a ball. That's why it's on the surface on, of a ball, on, on right? The surface or the yeah. center of a ball pivoting. Um, but once you add the pivot to translation, the game needs to model that for trajectories. And right. that's really interesting. That's when you get to shoot around corners and over tables. Yeah. Like you could, this thing you could conceivably lift up over your head and pew, pew, yeah. you get the kill shot by yeah. twisting your hand all the way upside down. Yeah. That's a kill shot. That's gotta, a kill shot. You got to relearn how to play at that point. I think that's really cool. Um, and as long as there's a, 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 a laser system or a dot system in the game virtually, it doesn't need to be 100% accurate in terms of gyroscope. And gyros are pretty accurate these days yeah but conceive of, well a gyroscope can, combined with an accelerometer gives you um yes uh, so that, that's why that this is, is this is why i'm excited about this this type of motion tracking system uh not so much the limb tracking but more in terms of shooter mechanics um how you'll be able to to well, do gun gun tricks so this conceivably like i don't know if you've ever played one of the ps3 or pc shooters that had um stereoscopic uh, support for TV, but for example, if you're playing Call of Duty, I think Black Ops or Black Ops Two with a 3D TV, you could when you iron sighted the gun, you looked down the you looked down the sight, and it actually looked like looking through a scope as opposed to looking through a hole on the screen with a dot in the middle that you lined up. So it made leading targets and stuff a lot easier because you had a much better idea of what the the depth was. This potentially takes you to the next level because then instead of hold, you know, when you lift up the gun, when you lift up the stem controller, yeah. And for example, the game is pressed, and it's all dependent on software. This only works if the game supports it. The software and, has to be good, and software has to be real good. If the optical tracking on your Oculus to, yeah. HMD knows can correlate with the relationship and doesn't block where the gun is, right? Bringing up your stem controller could tell the game you're looking down iron sights and the virtual model will go up closer and you'll get your depth of field. You see your and hands you, and in the right place in the game. And it's a smooth transition yeah. to iron sights as opposed to the animation that you get these days. Yeah, that sounds really exciting. That sounds I, fantastic. And so it sounds like sort of a modular razor. It is. It is. And the whole idea is that it's wireless and modular is their big innovation. And, and of course, they've done, they have some videos about exactly how they've improved the coiling. 
uh, and, the, and the and the, main, the, po- uh, the polling of, of yeah. location uh, to avoid the problems that they had previously in terms of like how many updates it got per second and interference. The main the main gist on that is that the coils previously were to get all six axes they need three coils. Previously they were three separate units, so they were all. Like in order to combine that data, they had to do some offset math and stuff like that that was a little bit tricky. Now they've actually built a sensor that's all three coils in one phys- the same physical space. So there's no no translation inaccuracy, which should reduce like judder and stuff and like that. And they pull XYZ all at the same time yeah. as opposed to staggered with, with each of the each um, So should we talk about how it works? Because this is the interesting sure. thing. Sure. And also uh, they, they launched new Kickstarter for their CAD program. So... Like how Oculus doesn't just want to be for games, Oculus was at Sundance this week showing off virtual concerts and virtual movie game experiences. Um, did, did they? So in the virtual concert, was there a tall guy that was really drunk and kind of violent in front of you? No, it was actually more interesting than that. Um, <laughs> Beck, that's I my believe, concert experience every time. Beck shot one of those um, 360 virtual um, concerts. He had a 360 like a camera on thing? stage. Oh, wow. And so it, it's one of those like animated panoramas, animated... Um, like a quick time VR, quick time VR thing where you can the video is playing, but it's playing 360, and so you drag your mouse, yeah. which makes sense for uh, VR. And so you put the Oculus on, and you're looking around. You can't move. Was like it 3D? No, uh, I don't know if it was 3D, but you, you're definitely looking around as if you're standing at one point on stage while the concert's going. And then that makes having 3D sound and recording for that environment mm-hmm. much more necessary, uh, which I think is more interesting than sitting in a virtual theater with the oculus which i know a lot of people did with those mods um i so like i don't want to be sitting on the stage to hear a concert well though, you that's ha- not it doesn't have be... to be on the stage but the okay. idea is that y- the virtual environment the concert being modeled in the virtual environment and having the th- sound being recorded and mixed at a certain way so you can experience the music from different positions and get a more if i'm in a virtual, virtual aerosmith concert can i throw my underwear at the stage like press you x could, to throw uh, underwear you can you can you can you could absolutely if, if with enough presence you can do anything <laughs> with enough presence but you know um uh, what oh sorry i was gonna say just like oculus wants to get in the spaces outside of games stem and six sense wants to get into cad and so the yeah. thing that they were really pushing was well they want to make cad easier more accessible well they, they want to find more ways to sell their software and their hardware that's true um and the thing they demoed is the software they called make vr which is cad software designed to be used with motion tracking system, six axis motion trackers, uh, which is what we'll use for the duration of the interview. Yeah. So I, I spent a lot of time, um, it was a 15 minute interview and I spent that plus a little bit more kind of learning how to use it. Um, and I've used some basic CAD stuff. I, I'm fairly proficient at doing stuff in sketch, like building plans to build stuff in SketchUp and, and one, two, three D design and stuff like that. Um, I, I found this to be a little bit, this reminded me a lot of early VR ML demos in not necessarily a positive way where you have to um, like it had the tools that are available in a more something that's designed more for 3d modeling necessarily than CAD, like, like um, Maya or something like that. But it lacked the software that they were showing lacked any of the precision controls that you have in something like Maya or 3d studio or something like that. I think there's a reason that mouse has nothing has surpassed the mouse in terms of being precision pixel precise. Um, you can extrapolate all that with touch, and touch is great. Yeah. But and we know that touch, for example, um, in CAD software works great as a camera tool. Um, when you st- while you still use the pen, a stylus, or a mouse for your precision tweaking and drawing, uh, and this felt like the same thing. Looked like the same the, thing. The problem that they were solving is is like the fastest thing that you learn when you're learning to use CAD software. Is like how to manage the three orientation, the three and axis and cameras, and all that stuff. Yeah, um, seems like it always will make a great demo, though. Once it, they can get you inside the space, yeah, it was if an you're, okay demo. No, <laughs> I'm saying if I'm a client and I've requested an object to be made, if I can go into the office and they can give me special gloves yeah. that I can reach in and like rotate yeah. it. Like this one, I, I almost like. By the end, I, I kind of wished that I had one of these controllers to do the camera controls and broad movements, and then I had my other hand on just a normal mouse mm-hmm. to do the fine motor control and stuff like that. Because um, my fingertips are much more precise than my wrist is the is the upshot. Um, 
I, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that that's necessarily a, an application that people are going to go bonkers for. I think that games with Oculus will probably sell a lot more units for them ultimately, but yeah. I could be wrong. This concert idea is, is pretty cool, though. I, I, I doubt it's 3D video. I'd be mm -hmm. very impressed if it was. I think just getting the, the video... 360 video done right is yeah. a challenge. And I wonder what resolution the, that full video is because that's quite a lot of area to cover. Well, it's just like if you have the right rig to do it. Uh, do you remember there was that iPhone case mod that we saw at CES? Yeah, I've seen the rig three years ago. It shoots up. That shoots up and then yeah. it just distorts yep. the recording. If you're missing oh, a that lot thing of was black terrible, space. terrible, though. Yeah. Uh, I hope it's not that. I hope it's actually <laughs> multiple camera systems used with mirrors and optics. Yeah, the I, it has to be 3D. Like I, it, I want 3D with the glasses. I have only seen 3D panoramas. I've never seen, which itself is a trick to pull off. I've yeah. never seen 3D video panoramas. 3D video panoramas might, might make you super sick because you don't have control. If the camera moves, you don't have control over your, that movement. And that, like, that, that disassociation is one of the things that makes people really nauseous. I mean like an interactive panorama. Oh, something you, know, you could like walk a, around like a 3D in? 3D interactive panorama. That, that sounds impossible. That's what we're talking about. Maybe this could be. But... I think that this is still going to seem like black and white TV to our kids. You know, this the fact that you are you would be stationary at an inter, at a interactive virtual concert is is it sounds your your kids well, is going to so jack and, straight and, and you know in. And, get, you know. it, it, and yes, it does go back to that Minority Report thing. And remember in Minority Report when he's watching the video of his his old his old family videos, and it was two D video but projected on in the three D space. Yeah. We have that technology now to take video and and analyze scenes. I mean, it's, it's what Microsoft did with, um, what was it called? Uh, not the dragon, sea dragon, but um, photosynth. Oh, photosynth, yeah. Photosynth, where, and that was with photos, but if you analyze if photos you have and videos, photos, yeah. if you have enough photos and videos, you can create uh, 3D maps. Exactly. And if you project the video, even though it's from one perspective onto that 3D map, and be able to navigate, that's how I imagine these concerts are. And but that's a hack. I mean, I think what we're going to actually see is something more akin to like a high, super high defini definition. Nano connect. robots, each with a camera, no, 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 each no. takes their picture from a million different perspectives it'll, and then stitches those together in be, a live environment. It'll be real 3D video recorded in something that is the next connect, you know, where we can actually record an entire space and then you can exist and walk through that. It'll be like a video game, but all the modeling and texturing is done with video. I think you guys are crazy. Mega textures. I think we should talk Ultra about textures. <laughs> Speaking of the future. Uh, but th I think the idea is that we're less enthused about STEM as a CAD uh, as, as a CAD interface and make VR as a, as a CAD application. I'm, we're not CAD designers, so I have no idea. Maybe some CAD people are really excited about this. The um, comments on that video would imply otherwise. But I think definitely excited about STEM as a uh, motion tracking for games if the software is there and if people actually develop for it, good games for it. Yeah, I, I, I'm... I think that the precision on that sensor has to be a lot better if you're going to use it in games. Unless the games are specifically designed to work around that. But we'll see. I mean, we didn't play games with it, so we don't know what we don't know what the game environment's like and it could be the game if the game is uh Temple Run and all you need to do is put your hand out and grab things. I don't want to play that game already. And and, and in virtual space. This game sounds terrible. Um, I don't need more Temple Run. Is it can Temple Run Cars edition because I'd totally play that though. At this point, it's going to have a lot to do with whatever Oculus and Valve bless. That's the thing. With their game development know-how. Well, and money. If, if Oculus yeah. gives somebody a bunch of money to make a STEM game, which I can't imagine that they're going to do, but maybe, then oh, yeah, that would I be I want to create the accessory that is the fan system. And it blows wind at you depending on the game. And Didn't Phillips API. make that? Phillips was light. Uh, I had light lights sums, and fans, dude. A little bit of fans. Logan but, reviewed that. But it was it was more. I was more ambient. I'm talking about. It was called AmbiX. for for games like your your infinite runners in VR, Ugh. blowing blowing at you so you feel it. This is a Saturday Night Live skit here. And and so. <laughs> it's like someone fanning you there's as a, you're running a, right, and, on the Omni. Oh, the as water, you're running there's on a the waterfall. Omni, there's a waterfall. And then, and then the, the wind comes from underneath. And then, and then the headset will, will track your mouth uh, breathing and then will show you your, your, your mouth breaths in, in the uh, cold environment. Oh, this sounds terrible. Get yourself a whirlwind pin, pinball machine. I'm, All about presence. I'm just really whirlwind has fans. Whirlwind pinball, yeah. I had a fan up above the back box. And oh, whenever the storm would come, it would turn the fan on and it would blow you. And love it. Somebody actually here at California Extreme modified their whirlwind to have a leaf blower. <laughs> so, really? So when it turns on, it's. 
Ugh, that's like what I'm cheek, talking about. Yep, cheeks flap out. Yep. I just worry that if if like we're still probably six months to a year at minimum from seeing real Oculus for consumers ship and real Oculus games for people to play ship, and I I worry that we're going to see a load of crappy peripherals come out that try to try to mooch off of the Oculus goodwill and will fuck up the whole thing for everybody because by the, before the Oculus even has a chance. Before re- before people get a chance to see the demos that we saw with Crystal Code. Seventy five million dollars is a lot of money. Yeah, I know, but it all it takes is people spending three hundred dollars on one thing that's garbage for them to not spend three hundred dollars ever again on mm. that same thing. Yeah. I mean, we've seen like th- there's a real thin window to get this right, and I I just it makes me anxious that that bad stuff is going to ruin the whole VR revolution. Yeah, Nvidia three D Vision. Oculus right. has their priorities right. So I, I think when, when interface becomes a priority for them, it'll be the right time. Just to be clear, I am not, I think Oculus, I think absolutely had Oculus released a consumer version of that kit before there were games that were worth playing for it, they would have made a horrible mistake and it would have ruined the whole thing for everybody. Because if I paid $300 right. and the best game that I had to play was a Lunar Flight, I would be super bummed out. Now, I like Lunar Flight. I think it's really cool, but it is not a game that like normal people, if, you, if we put Gary in that, he's not going to be impressed. And he is the. I, is I, that true? I treat Gary as the the epitome of the of the the VR couch aficionado. Does he regret his purchase? I don't think he paid for that, but I could be wrong. <laughs> okay. I don't think he regrets his purchase. He's he's had a lot of fun with it. Okay. But it's like it's noodling around fun. It's not playing games fun. Yeah. Um, three years from now, they're exciting. Three years from now, assuming it makes it that far, it will be amazing. Yes. Um. I spent a lot of time more again with Steam OS and now the in game street, the in home streaming beta. So they, uh, Valve turned that on late last week uh, for some people. Did you get into that, Norm? Or, or yep, did you? I'm absolutely. Okay. Right. Um, I spent a lot of time Thursday and Friday of last week testing it out. It's, it's super interesting. So, uh, so I should explain what it is. Uh, Steam in home streaming lets you treat any machine that's on your network as a server that can pipe video games out to any other ne- machine on your network that's also running Steam. So what that means is I can play big AAA PC games on my MacBook Air without having to dual boot or any of that nonsense, assuming I can plug a gamepad into my MacBook Air and, and get the experience. What are the want. higher requirements on the receiving side? Uh, it has to run Steam. It seems like it That's seems it. like there's very little hardware requirements on, on, Mac the, OS, on the hardware even. size. Uh, on Linux, you can run Steam OS and stream to the Steam OS box. Yep. The bandwidth requirements. It, it's unclear exactly what the server side requirements are. Like you could, I, I think I've streamed, um, a couple of the Steam OS native games, Linux native games, to my Windows PC. I can't remember if I actually got that to work or not. I know that was a little hinky at first. Uh, but the the obvious use case for this is, hey, I have a big loud gaming PC in one room, and I want to play those games on my TV with a gamepad or a Steam controller, theoretically. Um, and so I tested that out at, at fair length using the this guy, this Intel Nuke box that were that I built as a Steam OS box, uh, and it's pretty good. It works pretty well. Uh, they made uh, constant improvements to it. They're constantly updating the beta client that you have to use if you want to participate. Uh, and if you have been invited to participate um, and uh, like stuff that didn't work on Thursday when it was brand new now works a lot. Most of the stuff in fact, actually in that article I wrote last Friday uh, now works. So it's, it's uh, it's, I wouldn't spend money on it yet. If you're looking to get that, I'd like you're better off running an HDMI cable, I think. But if you have a wired ethernet connection into your living room, then it is a pretty good experience. And for the games that work, it, the experience is good. The latency is good. What do you mean good? Can you... Di- can you? Um, yeah. I was able to play Super Meat Boy up until like the hell levels. I couldn't play hell levels. That's impressive. Yeah. Um, I was able to play... Uh, I played a lot of Bioshock, Infinites. I played some of that Clash in the Cloud stuff because I hadn't played that yet um, and was as competent as I am with a controller on the PC directly or, or with the HDMI cable plugged into my uh, TV from the computer. Um, the color saturation is a little bit reduced on the streamed video, which I think is probably just a factor of being H.264 compressed, if I had to guess. Um, it's all enabled because it's NVIDIA put H.264 encoders in their 
their new cards. Well, but I mean, if you look at a modern system, there's a lot of H.264 encoders. Your Intel post-Sandy Bridge Intel CPUs also have H.264 right. encoders. But we're talking about going through, going through bus as opposed to from buffer to H.264 That's true. and latency. It's unclear. Like, they haven't actually come out and said this is using the on-GPU encoding technology. Um, if NVIDIA is, if is required. No, NVIDIA is not required. Well, it works. They, they, don't, they, have not, they haven't posted hardware requirements for the server. Okay. Part of the beta is figuring that stuff out. Um, I don't have, I, I, I didn't try it with my GTX 580, which doesn't have the hardware encoder. I can probably swap those out and, and test that out. Um, the reports on the Steam forums were that if you're doing this with an AMD machine that doesn't support that stuff, it's a real bad experience. Um, also, to doing it over wireless, I have 5.4 gigahertz, 802.11n, and the latency is noticeable over that versus the wired, obviously. Um, if I don't have an AC native machine. I would guess that an AC machine will probably be better. Um, but it seems like for 1080p, it's an it's a um, eight megabit ish stream, which you can configure. You you can you can crank down the resolution, but. If you're going to crank down the resolution, then... Well, you can't change bitrate independent of resolution. Uh, you can limit the bitrate, but you can't set a bitrate. So you can say, okay, this is the maximum bitrate I can support. Okay. Um, there's a good tools in the, in the, on the streaming client. You can press F6 and see uh, bitrates, latency, frame lag, all that stuff. Um, it seems to work much better with a, with a gamepad than a mouse just because of the less deterministic movement of a gamepad. Uh, you, you know, there's not as many, you, you can't move as quickly, which means that there's much less weird lag with the mouse. So I can't imagine you're gonna be playing StarCraft. It works with everything. Theoretically, it should work with everything that supports the Steam overlay. So that means old direct draw games won't work, um, but most everything else will. And you can even put uh, third, uh, th games that aren't necessarily Steam games, assuming the overlay works with them. So you could play StarCraft through this if you wanted. I, I wouldn't recommend that. That's going to be bad. But uh, yeah, so that's that's Steam overlay. Uh, Steam OS also got an update this week so that you can dual boot and use no UEFI uh, motherboards that don't support UEFI. Uh, that's part of a beta rollout. Uh, but it's so you have to go to the discussion boards and download from a thread that says Steam OS beta that was posted yesterday or the day before. So, so yeah, that's uh, Steam OS stuff. What do you think of the streaming? Did you try it, Norm? I didn't try the streaming yet because I just built the PC for that. And okay. That we done this weekend. Okay. I'm interested. Are you wired to your living room or no? I am not wired. So you have I'm, your, your 802.11n, 2.4 gigahertz. I'll be interested to see how that works. Um, do you want to talk about True Detective? I watched the first episode of True Detective last night. Jeremy, have you seen True Detective? No, Will is saying I have to watch it. You Everyone should. has to watch it. I've you watched should. through episode three, so I, I don't know if we could talk about True Detective at, for different points of the show. It's good. It's. I, I just want to say people should watch it. It is the best TV. Like the first, that pilot was really, really amazing. Really? All right. And, and Sign me up. That's at the end good. of it, Gina and I looked at each other and we're like, should we watch the next one? And we decided not to because we wanted to save it. It was good enough to save. HBO. No new episode. HBO, HBO, right? HBO. It's HBO. Oh, right. Ten episode anthology series. Is this it's a, like standalone? It means that if they get, it gets renewed and probably will likely get renewed, seeing that it was the biggest HBO debut in a long time for a new show. Yeah. Uh, if it gets renewed, the writer has said that the second series, the second season, would be a completely different story, new cast, like different cops, different. <clears throat> okay. So the but the setup is that Matthew McConaughey and and Woody Harrelson are cops in Louisiana. State like state trooper detectives, and in 1995, yeah, in the past, in the, and, yeah. I didn't know it was 95, but that makes sense, given the beepers. Um, it's totally worth watching. You should watch. You should watch what I've seen so far. Um, I've been futzing around with analog arcade sticks um, for a project that I'm working on. It's uh, I hadn't used. I didn't know that there was such a thing as analog arcade sticks outside of like flight sticks. Um, but uh, Ultimark makes a stick called the Ultra Stick 360 that it, they bill as a configurable in software four-way, eight-way, two-way analog st solution. Um, I don't. And, and why do you need analog? Because uh, I want to play PC games instead of arcade games. Oh, very good. So I want to play games that require analog controls like Samurai Gun, Nidhogg, and stuff like that, uh, Hokra, um, 
some of the sports friends games and they require analog controls rather than they, I mean, they would probably work with digital controls, but they'll be better with analog controls um, than an eight way stick. Uh, so uh, I, this thing is amazing though. I was really pleasantly surprised. You plug it in, you plug a, a like an eight or 10 pin header into it and then wire in normal arcade push buttons. It's a USB device, so you plug it into a USB port on the computer, and it just shows up as a gamepad, basically, for Windows. So that means anything that works with generic gamepad games is just going to work, uh, which I didn't think was going to be possible with an arcade-style stick. So I was pretty stoked to, to find that Where'd out. Where did you find it? Uh, it's I Googled and then asked some people I know about arcade stuff to see what they liked, and they all were like, don't. No, analog arcade sticks are bad. And I was like, they explained what I was doing. They're like, oh, okay, well, th this is the thing you want. It's probably not good for, don't play arcade games with this, but for this, it'll be good. Hmm. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's weird, though, because when you play a game like Super Meat Boy that you're accustomed to using your thumbs to control and you have like a, I, I've got to build a mock-up mock box for it to test control configuration because I haven't gotten that far yet. Yeah. Um, and that's that's the next next phase. We'll talk about and, more next. And there's just little the solder future. pads on there where you can wire up your switches. It's not even solder pads. It's like a Molex eight pin for the buttons. For the buttons, yeah. Oh, so they just run so right out. It's a it's a you have to it's crimp, a harness. You crimp your own wires. You could crimp your own, or or you could buy. Uh, they sell they sell the harness. Oh, so you don't have to look at that. that. Yeah, cool. It was pretty easy. Um, and like I said, shows up as a, as a gamepad, single analog stick gamepad with eight buttons, which is perfect. I dig it. Um, you can connect up to four to a computer. Uh, do you want to talk about Kickstarter or you want to save that for later? Let's talk, let's talk about both like, Kickstarter and her sure. after answering some questions. Oh, okay. We can take some questions. Um, emails? Well, but we do the other one. Emails. You know, we don't do emails. We do emails. No, 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 no. Questions. No. Boom. If you have a question for This Is Only a Test, the email address is podcast at tested.com. Please keep your questions short, under 45 seconds, or... Uh, you know, reasonably concise if you submit written questions. Our first question comes from Chris Hoffman. He asks, actually, we had a couple of uh, uh, camera questions. And I'm uh, Chris and this other guy, Kevin Sullivan, asked basically the same question, but I like Kevin's question better, so I'm going to ask his instead. Hello, uh, I am a high school student. I have next to no money, and I've been planning to buy myself a DSLR camera. I've been looking at the Canon Rebel T3i, and I was wondering if saving for a more expensive camera would be worth it for someone just starting in photography. Thanks. This is a normal no. question. No. Buy the T3i. Totally fine. I know Jeremy here bought the T5i. You don't need the T5i. I it, know you have the T3i before. They're not before. that different. They're absolutely not that different. No, I mean they're not that different in price. The T5i is actually less on Amazon new than the T4i. And I think that might be because there's there's ha there's firmware that you can add that unlocks a lot of functionality in the 4i that is uh, too uh, early for the T5i. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I think that there is more there are more used T3i's in the market at yeah. this point, and so getting getting a used T3i is the better way to go. Um, and just be careful when you're buying lenses. If you, T3i they can use the EF hyphen S lenses, which is made for that series of camera, or the EF ones, but if you upgrade later, you can't use the EF-S lenses on a bigger, more expensive full-frame camera. So the idea is that you buy a relatively expensive body, buy like one good lens to start out, or maybe two good lenses. Do you have recommendations on lenses? I Just start with the kit lens? Get the 1855 kit lens. Okay. That's a that's a good good place to start. It's like a, what, 35 to 70 or 80 equivalent for the crop? It's a yeah, it's APS-C sensor on those. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, that that is my recommendation for that. The other question, oh, Chris can I, Hoffman. Can I just say, don't get the T1i if you want to shoot video. T1i. Yeah, <laughs> that's the one you the had The original before. one. Yeah. I, so when I had learned 1080, is shot at 20 frames per second. That's no. That's good. weird. The yeah. very next one, the T2i, they started a proper 30 frames. Yeah. But T3i, I think, it was a, a good sweet spot. For, for that series. Um, and After then that became very iterative. The corollary for Chris Hoffman's is that he bought a three series mirrorless Sony camera. Um, and now his daughter's playing indoor volleyball and he needs something that's a little bit faster, uh, faster, I assume focus and does better in, in indoor lighting. Any ideas? Um, don't use a mirrorless camera because they use contrast. Most of them use contrast detect autofocus, and not a lot have the phase detect. And you want the phase detect for faster autofocus. I'd say learn uh, learn your camera's tracking, um, focus tracking. Um, what does that mean? It means there are different uh, focus modes. Um, there's somewhere you, if you 
hold the focus and it will computationally track your object and shift focus as you tra move the camera along with the object for sports as opposed to locking it in that plane uh, and learn those modes first. But uh, I'm not exactly sure what the best thing is for sports. I think uh, turn the dial to the running man. <laughs> turn the dial to the running man on your, on your uh, priority <laughs> setting. Okay. Um, you know, we, this next question is real dumb, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, OSHA Riley wants to know how realistic and what technology is needed in order to proceed with the formation of civilization on the exoplanets surrounding us. I assume that means the planets outside the solar system. Uh, once we have found the ideal exoplanet with the ideal distances from the neighboring planet slash sun. Maybe we want to tackle that one. Or are we just going to, is that a pass? Jeremy, where is this? If written? you, I, this I didn't written? put, I didn't, I, this oh, one, God. this is a late breaking question. <laughs> Just came in. It's coming in hot an hour ago. Uh, do you feel that we have the technology today to visit exoplanets? No. Do you feel like we have the technology in our lifetime to visit exoplanets? No, no, no not our lifetime. I think the closest sun is light years and light years away. Four, 3.95 light years away. The closest yeah. sun is like a 10 year trip away. Uh, given acceleration, current. deceleration. For really? Human, for humans? No way, dude. We don't have the way. We don't have the capability to go uh, a four a four tenths of the speed of light and slow down when we get there. You're talking about slingshotting around the sun first. Yes, like yes. like in Star Trek Four, like in every. What, what, science you go back in time. Um, we got a lot of exploring, and we don't know here. if there are planets in that system inhabitable. Well, yeah, we're not gonna. I mean, here's the thing: by the time we get there, you're not gonna like. It, it's 50 years to send something there and get the information back. Yeah. So start, start your training your kids today. Think about Mars baby steps. First Martians. Um, one more question is from Will Gonzalez. He says, I've been thinking about getting an espresso maker for my home and remembered Will saying he has a Ranchilio Sylvia. Um, how do you feel about the Sylvia? I remember you saying it was finicky. Uh, yeah, so my after spending six hundred dollars on a Sylvia, which is I think cheaper than they are now, they've gotten more expensive. You, you, if you want to make drinks that have milk in them, so coffee espresso plus milk, you need a double boiler machine. Otherwise, you have to cycle the boiler between pulling the shot and steaming the milk. That sucks. It makes the it means either your coffee or your steamed milk is going to be cool by the time you're ready to pour the coffee. Um, it's they require a ton of maintenance. So if you're going to buy an espresso machine for the home, you need to plan on using it. It needs to be something you're going to use every day and not, you know, Sunday morning when you want to spend some time making coffee. Um, I feel like in order to get a decent espresso at home, you probably have to buy a really expensive machine and a $500 grinder probably. I think that advice applies pretty much anything you buy, most things you buy that you don't need. If it's something you use every day, then... Well... The, the promise of the espresso machine is, hey, I spend $4 every time I go to Starbucks. This thing only costs $500. Or in reality, you're usually standing at the Bed Bath & Beyond one that costs 150 bucks, And you're like, ah, this will pay for itself in 30 days. And then the coffee's really bad and you're sad and you, you end up – then you end up on this upgrade path that ends up with you spending two grand on something. And, and there's still a fair amount of maintenance involved like the automatic machines are not particularly though they don't make particularly good coffee the um the, there's a shitload of maintenance involved with an espresso machine you have to decalcify and descale the boiler fairly regularly just because the act of boiling water unless you're using filtered water um inside a, a copper boiler makes a lot of salts build up in there and then that reduces the efficiency of the boiler and that makes your coffee come out sour so you have to use all this it's it's a it's just go spend the three dollars at the barista when you want to get a nice cup of coffee and brew good coffee. It's a nice walk anyway. It's good for you to walk if you live in a city. Uh, that'll do it for questions this week. Uh, I'm going to play. Some, I think we're done. Podcast at Tesla .com is the email address. Uh, I'm going to play today's outro, which comes from 333. We got a lot. He, I just want to say last week I said we hadn't had any outros in a while and a couple of people posted several 333, I think posted 15 outros or something, some insane number of outros. Uh, here is today's outro. If you want to submit one Google raw outro song file, the instructions are in the first post there, post them in the thread, make sure you mark them downloadable on SoundCloud. And here's the outro. I, I think we're going to hang around and talk about some other stuff after this. We are.
Hi there, I didn't see you. That's it. I think it's I think it requires incredibly pre precise fingering. We'll see that in a couple weeks at the end of the show. That's it. Story checks out. Um what are we talk about her or Kickstarter? Kickstarter first. I want, I want to end with her. I want to know. <laughs> I want to know what it's like. You're so you're in the process right now of getting like a Kickstarter up, and I want to know what that what that's like. Well, it's I, a it's a lot of work. It actually is a ton of work. You know, they, I, I was prepared to. People say doing the Kickstarter is kind of a job in and of itself. You've done it before. Keep the momentum. No, of course not. That was my first Kickstarter. Oh, I thought you did the, the table as a Airfield? Kickstarter. Yeah. No, I, I funded that. Oh. That's why I'm doing the Kickstarter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you learned, you learned an important lesson. I learned that one. Okay. So, um, yeah, Kickstarter is brilliant, and uh, it's, it's wonderful. But setting it up is a lot of work. and you, So you have to do all the basics. You have to decide what category you're in. Certain categories have certain rules for hardware. You can't sell more than one of an item. Um, you have to have a functional prototype. You can't have like a napkin sketch. Yeah. Then you have to write your story, and then you have to write your um, script. Yeah. Well, yeah. You have to script it. Yeah. Obviously, you have to shoot a video. And they don't, you Do don't, they require a video now? They don't, but they encourage you because this, the, yeah, the makes a lot of sense. That have videos that have a higher success rate. No, you have to come up with your. Um, God, I, I always forget what's at the very bottom. The, the liabilities. The, the statement risks. of yeah, risks. the risks. Thank you. Um, where that they ha you have to put that in there. They will not let you submit without it, and I think that's part of their own liability. liability. Well, that's part of the post. The, the, there was a little bit of a scandal last year. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know if, what you're referring to, but basically, I can't remember which one it if was. a Kickstarter never ships a thing, Kickstarter is indemnified. They have Absolutely. no responsibility. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So um, I don't know. It's just a, quite a lot. So you know, I, I talked to people about shooting the video, but I decided to shoot it myself, so I rented some lights from borrow lenses, I set up a shot, I turned my iPad into a teleprompter, strapped out to the camera, it's just a ton of work. And then all the reshoots, and then the photographs for the story. Oh, it man. looks great. Yeah, it turned um, out really good. You're, you're in the, so you made your page, decked it out, figured out your award structure. It's, hold on, then, is, the, is making the page just like a normal WYSI, it's just like making an eBay posting or, it's, like a blog post or something like that? I would say it's easy. It's more beautiful than an eBay page. Okay. It's, it's, they really have a... The back end is as nice as the front end to okay. Kickstarter. It's a well-designed page. Um, and then you're in the review process right now, and that yeah. itself takes you know some time. It could take a week for hardware. A human mm -hmm. being looks at it yep. someplace. Yep. Okay. Um, and then we can say that you know when it's live, this will be for the game frame. Yeah. Yeah, no, I've, I've, I've showed it on your 24-hour um, podcast, and mentioned it before yeah it's for the it's a iteration of the pixel box that i showed on your show the grid almost eight, Game grid. six eight months ago yeah so it's, it's a you know 256 pixels that are you know intended to show old school video game art or pixel art or what, what have you it so looks wonderful so do you think those people who do the approvals on the kickstarter do you think they spend a ridiculous amount of money on kickstarter stuff like do you think they get because they know what they like? They're cherry picking the stuff that they want and getting all the early birds. I think there's all that policy business. to not let them back certain things to get in on early, early adopter. Uh huh. I don't know. I bet. I, I bet. What a job! Because so many there's they run the gamut. There's Kickstarters up there that have videos, but you're like, did you have you watched the video before? Are you, are you sane? Yeah, I mean, they you usually offer a little more information than this, or there's usually voiceover. You know, yeah. it's like. <laughs> Uh, some are just images. It's <laughs> you did a wonderful video. Uh, very, I mean, you used to edit video professionally, so it, it, all your covered shots were great. The product, which is tough to light, I mean, even taking photos of, and tough to communicate yeah. the luminance of it uh, in photos and video, I think comes across and uh, looks better in person. I, so we don't know when it's exactly it's going to launch. Hopefully, you're hoping to launch soon. Yep, this Kickstarter. Uh, we will be doing. Uh, we will let you know. Tested followers uh if you are interested uh you can watch that video that jeremy did with us last year where you brought the first prototype of your game frame um to get an idea of what what the, it looks completely different the new prototype looks a lot better it looks like, more polished I thought, the last, it, I thought the first one looked really good but this one looks really uh, nice but to get what the concept is uh so please follow jeremy and us and we will be tweeting it what i want to do though and i pitched this to you jeremy um no pitch necessary is because you're going to be assembling these 
yourself basically in the U.S. You're sourcing some parts. You know, some your laser cutting is going to be done locally. No cart before the horse. If it's successful, I'll be assembling. If these. it's successful, you will be assembling these game frames yourself. As I have volunteered myself to work your assembly line and assemble game frames, and we can do a live stream video of one day of building game frames. Sure, or at least a time lapse or something. Yeah. That'd be fun. No, live video. All right, live video. Building, building game frames. Riveting. All day long. I'm going to be the uh, compliance cons uh, constructor here, <laughs> so I can come in and make sure that the working conditions in this San Francisco sweatshop are up to par. Well, we, uh, you know, put little surprises in, in, in boxes as you ship them out. I want to make little, sure little surprise and delight. There's handrails. That's the whole thing. Very kind of you, Norm. I'm excited for this. Thank you. It's, it's a product that I want. Which yes. Is why I'm excited for I think it. we both want this product. I'm, um, I'm relieved to be almost done. Um, well, you know, everybody says that the actual time that the Kickstarter runs is way more stressful than the time leading up to the Kickstarter. Yeah, even when we were, uh, when like Cast AR was here, we did that video with them. Yeah. Uh, they were here just as when we were shooting a video with uh, Jerry Ellsworth. Uh, it had and, been up for about like 30 hours or something. Um, they had just passed their, their, uh, their oh, goal. Oh, that's it. Their goal, yeah. And while they were here and... Rick was checking his phone, and mm -hmm. it becomes they, they become addicted to it. I think Jerry, Jerry said it's really damaging. <laughs> yeah, and even like when Pebble, one of the famously successful Kickstarters, you know, you can see in the early interviews they did, they were um, they had the Kickstarter page in the background, just running that tally. Yeah. Well, I I talked to some of the people who made that that remember that solid block aluminum iPhone dock. Yeah, I um, bought three of those. Really? Oh, that's a great dock. Oh God. Okay. Anyway. It's a great I, dog. I'm sure it's wonderful. I'm not. I don't mean to judge. Um, I talked to some of those guys at XO Elevation a couple of years ago. Yeah. Elevation, and they said that it actually got worse because, like, this was before Kickstarter made people figure out what the plan is if you actually accidentally sell two hundred thousand of them. Fulfillment um, logistics. Because, like, their initial plan was to make them by you know on a on a CNC mill that could do like six things at a time. Yeah. And they thought, sure, we'll sell a couple of hundred of these. It'll take two days to run them off. That's no problem. And then they sold like ten thousand or some ridiculous number, and they had to completely rework their fulfillment for that because their their old plan wasn't feasible at that scale. Um, yeah, they and, asked for seventy five thousand. They ended up getting one point four six million. Yeah, and they they literally he, he said it was worse the better the more they sold. And then that come out right when the the dock changed. It came out the it week did. that the iPhone five came out, or yeah. right after it was announced. <laughs> so they they engineered a way to make it compatible yes. with yes. the lightning connector. Perhaps. I mean, the good thing is that the yeah the the dock connector was just screwed in a daughter board or something screwed into the bottom, right? Yeah. Um, but it yeah. Oops. Yeah, big time. I mean, they, they actually... That might have been the one that was the controversy, wasn't it? The, gr was it? the, great the, the great thing about the game. their original oh, right. connector was that it was a custom-made filed down one that the phone slid in and out of without any force. Yeah. So that made it so, so that it was effortless to insert and remove the phone, whereas the lightning connector requires more force. So they're now promising... And there are standards for lightning connector that require like, a pivot so you don't snap it right. um, on the actual dock itself. It's that's why uh, Lightning Connector Spear Docks are more expensive. <sighs> uh, it took a while to come out, at least. Um, cool. Looking forward to uh, when you launch. And uh, again, people out there, if you're listening, uh, follow us on Twitter and follow the site for announcements to hopefully get in early and, and help Jeremy out on something, a cool product. Um, I want this to succeed because I want one in my office. Thanks. That's all I'm saying. I'll I make, don't endorse products. I'll make you one anyway. As a general, no, I'm not, the, not in that business. Um, I'm paying. I want item, I want number five. <laughs> I want to make my own. Why do you want? No, no, no. Five? I don't want to make my own. No. I why would you want to make your own? I want to make it for like a hundred other people. Hold on. Just and to then be you're clear, you're going to make mine. Five. People who have watched your our videos might think that you building these is a negative in terms of the Kickstarter. Jeremy's going to be there to make sure that quality, quality control. control is <laughs> is completely up to par. Quality control. Yeah. Better put me at work than your son. <laughs> He's great. He's tiny he, hands though. He helped build that little Tron kit. There you go. Um, I know, I, I, I was talking to friend Steve Lynn earlier, and that came up. The Tron mod? Yeah. 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 He really yeah. liked that. He's a great guy. Yeah. Um, should we talk about uh, slow motion video ideas? Uh, this is very short. We uh, have in our possession now on loan uh, one of the Edgertronic uh, kick-started $5,000 yeah. uh, high-speed cameras. Um, and Joey is learning it this weekend. So mm -hmm. uh, if you've watched our stuff, you know, two years ago we – 
uh, rented the FS700 Sony camera to do some slow-mo stuff um, to varying degrees of success. Uh, we found for that camera, the sweet spot was around 240 FPS. I think we um, should recreate some of those shots. We, I have can, a whole lot of do, balloons at the house. We can do a lot of stuff. Uh, We're ready to go. Uh, that one did up to 960 FPS at very poor resolution. Yeah, it was like 320 by 200 or something this like that. This is a, not a consumer camera. It's more of a scientific camera. But uh, it does 720p at 700 FPS, which looks great. Great I, for smashing I kinda, bulbs. I want to go to the gun range. You're not going to be able to do gun stuff. So it does up to 17,000 FPS, but that's uh, the resolution of your video is 120, like 190, 126 by 96. So that's like, like that. for measuring flashes and stuff like that? You can blow it up and you can make out very minor details. But even at 17,000 FPS, you can barely catch a balloon exploding. Wow, really? Yep. Huh. You can A balloon can, popping can... goes two frames at 17,000 FPS. Can you, can you strobe to make that stuff go faster? No, it doesn't work that way. Uh, that's why water balloons and balloons filled with gas like uh -huh. or powder work so well because the inside holds its shape and the, flu the fluidity of uh, the uh. gas works uh, and it's visible. So we could fill it with propane, light the propane, light, light, light the balloon on fire, and you'll see the fireball. So the, the reason the it's on our list of things to discuss is that we are soliciting ideas. Yes. Uh, if you have uh, ideas of things, we have some already, some that might be dangerous, some that might be cool. Um, but we already know about the slow mo guys, so we're not going to yes, fill a not, giant balloon we're not with going water to, and mop pop it. We're not going to do anything. We're not going to light Norm on fire that the slow mo guys have done, unless it's something that's like that we can do uniquely. Yeah, we might hit each other in the face again. That was pretty good. Seven hundred FPS. It's um, pretty good. I think uh, so we might do the sneeze, which we couldn't do last time. Yeah, the sneeze we couldn't capture. Um, Sometimes. Sometimes it's now that we know that command. water balloons are different from party balloons, we you know maybe that's worth revisiting. Although it's a little cold right now, um, we have some other ideas for stuff that we we're thinking about too. So great news! This number is now eligible for a smartphone upgrade with zero percent down on AT and T next. Oh hey, congratulations! <laughs> I just got a message that my brother and sister in law just had a baby. Oh, congratulations, much man! Yep. you should come on our podcast more. Oh no, yeah. I, I, never mind. <laughs> It's, it's you, get, you get life stuff. Life happens news. when while during our podcast, as it turns out. Um, her, Jeremy. It's a he. Just kidding. Finally, we can talk about her. I, hey, I haven't seen this yet. No spoilers. Oh boy! So it's it's been a. I don't few know. Weeks I, now. You might. Do you want me to just leave? Ten minutes. All I need is ten minutes to talk about her. So, but I have I have to listen to it to edit it. We no, you know you no, you don't. It's too early for a spoiler, anyway. Don't you think? For the audience, we're going to do a spoiler cast with Adam for this. It's, he was really into that. So it's been nominated now for best picture, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. The movie about Siri. It's not about Siri. It's not about. Norm Siri. really bitched this movie out when it was when the not, trailer. Not came about out. Siri at all. I I, I thought oh that looks interesting. It's got Scarlett Johansson in it. Uh, I'll go see it. But I did not expect it to be this good. It's a fair assessment. You know, she's under fire for her support of the Soda Stream. Her endorsement. Yeah, didn't she say she, she told away from Oxfam that? to fuck off and said, "I'll take the Soda Stream cash." Yeah, sorry. It's well, you called it near future. Uh, it's several decades in the future. Mm -hmm. And in a, it's supposed to be in L.A., but filmed um, the cityscapes were uh, a composite of various cities. Um, I think the story itself. It, there's so many things to like about it. On one level, it is just the, the story about the relationship stuff between this character. Do you even remember his name? Theodore Thumbly? That's uh, a, that's a, Phoenix? That's like a Walter Mitty style fake name. I didn't remember his name though. Uh, th that's that's how irrelevant that his name is. To do you character. ever remember characters' names though? I, yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Right. I know you do, Norm, but not everybody uh, does. So, uh, on one level, you can really appreciate their relationship and this f science fiction story of how does a person fall in love with a machine. Uh, or how how do relationships work in this one directional way without a physical person? It's another take on the Lucy um, Lucy, Lucy Lou bot from Futurama. Sure, it's um, also AI. On one know, level, so it, it is on on one level you can really appreciate its take on yeah. AI and uh, and advancements in artificial intelligence and you know and where that will eventually lead up to. Um, you know, with people who, I mean, if you read about artificial intelligence, you read about 
Ray Kurzweil and that kind of stuff. Uh, on one level, it's a great, from a production design standpoint, their vision of society, both from a, a cultural perspective and from a, a physical, like the world building perspective, the physical world is fascinating, like how people interact with computers, what their living rooms look like, what housing looks like, um, what social you, gatherings you look like. You said when you came back from seeing it that it was much more um, like actionable and realistic than, say, Minority Report or any of the other science fiction movies I mean, in the last it's, 15 it's, years. Like it's a much more pragmatic press, a, it, a, a it's view. It's way more prescient a view of, prescient a view of, cult- of our relationship with technology than Minority Reports with. My Martin Reports flash, you know, flashy interface, uh, computer, Stem human, human computer interface. The whole th- movie is about human computer interface. You could say, um, the fashion attire, that stuff, that that's you know, aesthetic choice, which is novel and fun. Uh, I think Spike Jones said that it, he looks at you know, fashion is cyclical. And so that's that's why a lot of those choices were made. I mean, you know, it's not a spoiler that Walking Phoenix has a. Creepy mustache. He does have a creepy and mustache. Wears, uh, wears very hipster lenses. I think they said they brought like a hundred box, a box of hundred lenses, and he, they found the one that they were happy with. <laughs> um, from a production standpoint, it's also interesting that they. Hold on. So was he wearing glasses that he couldn't see through that whole movie? Because that would be maddening. What do you mean? Like he, he was wearing hipster lenses that, like big giant knobbly lenses that are going to make his eyes look funny. Is that what you're saying? No. Oh, they're just big, bigger frame, you know. Oh, oh, like like, like frames. You're frames. talking about frames. frames. I was like, yes. okay, no frames. Never mind. Um, the production of it is interesting, fascinating. How they recorded it with Samantha Morton originally cast as Samantha. That's Hold why on. the character is named Samantha. Who's right? Samantha? Samantha Morton is. Uh, she was in Minority Report as a uh, as one of the <laughs> as one of the. She's the precog. The precog. The smart precog. The one that came out of the milk. Yeah, <laughs> not the twins. The, wow. the, the 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 girl always the smartest one. Um, <laughs> that, there, that's a, there goes full circle. Uh, Samantha Morton acted in a box basically on set against uh, against uh, Walking Phoenix, and wow. then they decided he, uh, Spike Jones decided to that he didn't like the direction that was in after they shot it all, so they brought in Scarlett Johansson and then redid some of Walking Phoenix's lines also which I, I found out recently, but Walking Phoenix doesn't know which of the lines they kept from the original recording versus the final one. Mm. Um, it's something you have to watch, you should watch in theaters because of the audio mix, because the sound is encompassing. If you're talking about a disembodied voice from a computer, the, the ghost in the machine, then it would make sense that it's not directional because the way he listens to Samantha, the AI, is through an earpiece, and so that's in his head. It's voice in his head. Um, all these things. What I loved about it was that they didn't make any, they didn't take any, uh, make any concessions for her being a computer. Like they did, it, it, there was no element of data from Star Trek in Samantha. It, they, they just said, let's make her. She wasn't Pinocchio. Exactly. Let's just make her as real as a person would be. And right. see where that takes the story. On the tech and, side, and they let's, did. Let's not make it about technology. What are the eccentricities of a computer? Right. It was about the relationship a person would have with real artificial re- intelligence. Didn't there, wasn't there a bit in there about like the computers no longer needing like they, they would be able to compute with like corn or grain or some 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 techno babble or something that I thought was amusing. Mm. Um, but yeah, they didn't delve into like you know how operating systems work or data centers work or cluster computing or yeah. how, how this consciousness form comes to be. They that, hint at the powers that she might have that humans wouldn't have in terms of being able mm-hmm. to calculate things sure. and process things. And but but that, that's not the thrust of the story. Right. And it's also... But it, it, did, it did touch on consciousness a little bit. Like what, what a computer consciousness, how a computer consciousness would yeah. perceive our world mm-hmm. and abilities, cognitive abilities of the consciousness, but not so much the, you know, strong AI, weak AI arguments. Yeah. It also re- restored my um, optimism about the future of, of voice interaction with computers. Siri has done a lot to erode that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Siri is a parlor trick. Um, it's a parlor trick, not e- even in today's voice recognition, because yes, it can have the clever responses and tell Zoe Dashnell whether it's raining outside, and 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 make uh, and t- you know pull stuff from Wolfram Alpha. Um, but it's not nearly as uh, 
con contextually aware as Google's knowledge graph. And while Google's knowledge graph in Google Now doesn't have as much personality as Siri, way more useful as a, as a computing tool and interaction tool. I mean, you were saying that your son interacts through the computer through voice. Yeah. Voice commands, Google search happens through voice. But, but it still misunderstands him half the time. And, yes. and you never know what kind of result you're going to get from Google, if it's going to speak the result or not. Like this was as if talking to a person. You know, and that's that's the level of speech recognition that Spike Jones is imagining we will get to. With all and, the cadences of language. And responding with all the cadences too. And yeah, so that in, in what in whatever way like made me realize, okay, yes, perhaps one day we will get there even in my lifetime and that will be fantastic. And I was the the thing that was I thought was the most unbelievable thing was that uh the character uh could it, could voice dictate text without having to stop and start. And or make, speak punctuation. Or speak punctuation, right. right. And just... Exclamation point. Basically yeah. reading, and, and be able to think that way. Mm -hmm. That I thought was, that we'll never get there. Yeah. <laughs> Humans but, will never be able to dictate a letter as eloquently as this character could. One of my favorite parts in the movie is, um, I, I don't think this is a spoiler, but one of my favorite parts is when Joaquin is not paying attention to Samantha entirely, and he speaks to her in the way that he used to speak to his computer when it wasn't an AI, when, it, when the speech recognition was perfect. Oh, did she get pissed? And so he, he says something like, read mail. And she responds in a computer tone, okay, I will read mail to you. Wow. So, so it kind of has that interesting layer of, I, you know, I'm not just a computer. This, this interaction between computers and people and robots and pe robots i mean essentially you're talking about a you know a science fiction robot without a body it has always been one of the core struggles of science fiction like it's from from gorp standing there ready to destroy all humans gort. Or, gort sorry i don't think i ever actually saw the day there it stood still to be perfectly frank but yeah i mean it's just one of the it's one of the core tenants like starting like look at blade runner blade runner is about that whole thing well, like what all good science fiction, too good? robots in science fiction are supposed to ref make us look within and evaluate our humanity. Um, same with aliens. Um, and this movie does exactly that. It is a mirror in society. So you're saying if I look in the mirror, I see Scarlett Johansson? <laughs> oh, no. no go find a mirror. No I'll be right back. You see Joaquin Phoenix. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> and on that note, are we done? Are we calling it? Are you guys done? Wistfully. Yes. Uh, we will see you all next week with another episode of This Is Only Test. Thanks hey, for coming by, Jeremy. Next week is the 200th episode. We might do a dad cast next week, though, if we can't make the 200th episode happen at the Does right time. Does that not time. count? No, those aren't, those wow. aren't numbered. <laughs> October cast and dad cast and CES casts are off number. Wow. What? So you're saying 200's already in the past? We did 200 like three weeks ago, probably. Because each of the October casts is it's like six to four, six, six to eight episodes or twelve episodes. All so, right, two hundred episode coming soon, sometime in the, likely in the in future. February. Yeah, we'll uh, it, that it will absolutely be in February. See you guys then. Uh, bye.